So welcome back everyone and uh, we will move on to the plenary session by observing a minute of silence. So, uh, welcome back again and uh, now we will proceed with the plenary session uh, of the seminar and for this we have with us Professor Dr. Sachidanand Mohanty ji. He is a, a presently an adjunct professor in the School of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences at Oro University and a member of the governing board of the Oroville Foundation. He has formerly been uh, the head of the Department of English at Hyderabad University and uh, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Central University of Odisha. He has authored more than 27 books and has been awarded with many national and international awards, including those from the British Council, the Salzburg, the Katha, and the Fulbright. So I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, the Sampadanandji to honor our guest and uh, then move ahead with the plenary session. Now I would like to welcome Sachidanand ji for the, to, to address us on, uh, as, uh, uh, and proceed with the plenary session of this session. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, it is five minutes past 12. Professor Sambadana, the director of this conference, National Conference on Children's Society, Dr. Professor Kundan Singh, whom we heard with such interest, he spoke with such clarity, introduced the case of themselves. Also, Sachidana Mishra. My name is the Secretary of the ICP, who also spoke to us about his understanding of Vedanta and that is sure. And many other friends who are here, Professor Gautam Gosha, who is currently on, apart from other things, I was a member and a small college, and I'm not closely associated. I do have a kind of fondness for that. And my young <coughs> friend here, Nila, who has been instrumental and who has, whom he and his friends have offered this exemplary hospitality to us. And many other friends, like Ananda and Madam, and all others whom I have met yesterday, very happy and pleased to be in the modern world. 
And I really was very happy when five minutes back when I saw that lot of photographs were replaced by that of your. I'm very pleased. Because I think who are we compared to Swati Vikanda and Shuribin and the major thinkers in whose honor we all hold periodic conferences, basically to try to redefine them for our own understanding. There are two adjectives that always come to my mind when I think of Shuribin. And these two adjectives also may be applicable in some of the greatest figures of the 20th century, like Tagore and Swan Vivekananda. These two adjectives are epic and magisterial. Epic and magisterial. Whenever I read your window, I do not see that he is an activist, like Ishura Chandra Vidyasagar. Great personality, but he was an activist. I, when I read Tagore, for example, I see the similar kind of an approach, both epic as well as majesty. The ability to transcend the dualities and the boundaries which are created for us. And we are wrestling to find answers to both binaries and dualities. Nativism and internationalism. Gender, man versus woman. Ecology versus development, constant. These dualities face us, stare us in the face. How to resolve? Professor Singh talked about methodology and epistemology. I think as Marshall McLuhan had memorably said, the medium is the message. If you want to know, understand your Windows approach of acquisition of knowledge, then we become in the Sartagorian approach, for example, to read his writings. His writings give us valuable and vital clues to understanding the method of by the adoption of one, the Vedantic approach of identification, knowledge through identification, is not annulled the knowledge through dissection and analysis and through the logical method. The acceptance and embracing of one doesn't negate, negate the other. That's exactly what I always find in the writing. So the medium is the message. You want to read to understand the method read him and you will find that he is not really talking in a manner which will create hallucination in us, an annulment of our own thinking. But in other words, basically he takes us, you know, as a kind of wayfarer and he shows us the way, whether it is in his philosophy of education, whether it is a philosophy of culture. And I'm so grateful to Professor Mishra, Sampadana Mishra, when he said, referring to me, he said, you know, his contribution, I would say a minor, a modest contribution, is the context of I, I think I have understood as a student of cultural studies how to contextualize. And in order to contextualize, you have to be interdisciplinary in Because the disciplinary formations and the genealogy of disciplines and the manner in which disciplines have moved have more to do with our own convenience than the inherent movement in the disciplines. You know, Philosophy beginning with Plato and Aristotle. Literature trying to find a foothold in the Oxford University, holding on to the tales of comparative philology and political economy being created and politics and uh, economics diverging and sociology and anthropology. Are they, I think, seems to be a desire for their own turf than the inherent reasons for the separation of those. And I think happily today, in the context of the new education policy that is being implemented, the disciplinary boundaries are going to disappear, not only in the realm of higher education, friends, but in the school itself. One of the important principles that we are introducing, my committee, and I'm the chair of the committee, is introducing, is that multiple exits and multiple entries should be, should be concretized, should be implemented at the school level itself. At the school level, we should have you know, credit transfer. At the school level, the school level should abolish the streaming from the sciences and arts. So I'm mentioning about this because this is something which was integral to show. 
And if you were to look closely at the life divine in general and the two chapters that have been in Bhagavad you find the, the disappearance of all those things, in the boundaries and the boundaries that very often inhibit the acquisition of knowledge. It may not be entirely fortuitous that you had the wrote and published the first 52 original chapters of the life divine in the Arya. A period of turmoil, a period which was called the Great War, a war which would not really spare the civilian population, a total war. The culmination of the total war was witnessed during 1939 and 40. And Shorbindu wrote the first four chapters, and they were revised later on in the 30s, and they were published immediately in the aftermath of the Second War. The major revision of Life Divine. The writing of Life Divine took place during 1914 and 1919. When Shorabindo met Mira Alpasa and Paul Richard, and Shorabindo for the first time and the only time joined hand in editorial matters with another thinker, Paul Richard. And they said, what is going to happen? They said, there is going to be a big explosion. And what should we do when there is an explosion of this kind? And Shorabindo and Paul Richard come together and they start the Aryan, the journal, the philosophical journal, Arya. And the best of the writings of Shorabindo take place in the Arya. And beyond that, in the 1920s and 30s, Shorabindo says, I have no because I have to write letters to my devotees and believe in my Lord. So Arya period is very important. And Arya is produced at the height of the first world war. And Arya, and the essays of, of life divine in the Arya are devised during this. I think it's very important to bear in mind destruction and creation. Many of the contemporary Indian thinkers like D.H. Lawrence, Carl Jung, and Aldous Saxley sought the regeneration of the West in the aftermath of the devastating total war. Lawrence's quest took him to the remote heartlands of the American Southwest, in Taos and Santa Fe in New Mexico, to the habitat of the Native Americans, just as Alder Sachs created. The ideal in his novel, Island, that halfway situated halfway between the Andaman Islands and Sumatra, a fictional setting, which goes beyond the brave new world, which was a parody, which was a kind of a dystopia. So I'm saying that this is not an accident, that in the aftermath, and then somebody who was a member of the Lord's generation, and I'm referring to the Nobel laureate Ernest Hemingway. And Hemingway, you know, is creating his own ideal in the Caribbean, in his, you know, uh, utopia, in, in his yacht, Pilar, in the Caribbean, in Cuba. And he met Margaret Mead, the noted anthropologist. And when he, she is concerned about the element of the Western civilization and society, creates this idea of utopia in American South Pacific and Samoa or Southwest. So when utopias are being attempted by the contemporary <coughs> intellectuals for different kinds, I mean, Lawrence, Carl Yu, and Alder Saxe, I'm saying that why is that a certain pattern, a certain pattern is here? I think as cultural historians, we have to try and find out. That is why I try to really situate you in a certain, and like divine in a certain context. By trying to create, to set him in a certain context, we do not devalue his significance. Quite the contrary, he gains in terms of world recognition by situating him in a certain kind of a national and international. Shorabindo was not an Indian thinker. He was a global thinker. He had an Indian origin. Mother had a French origin. But mother was global in her own way. I'm not saying. And you have to read Leela Gandhi's effective community to understand the significance of Shorabindo and the mother as world leaders. They're rooted in the French soil, they're rooted in the Indian soil, but they go beyond India and they go beyond national boundaries. They become international. So this is true in the life divine in general. 
is equally true in the two chapters I'm going to handle in, in this film. The Bolshevist revolution takes place in 1970. Earth shaking. And you know, it's completely revolutionized our own approach to the construction of the social order. And I've been a student of not just Lenin and Bolshevist revolution, but I have been a student of Emma Goldman and Emma Roy. You have to understand Emma Goldman and Emma Roy. I think you have to look at one of the most frequent and most recent epochs of the human history. There is no, no epoch which really is, which is other than the 1920s. 1920s has been a neglected kind of an area from the point of view of the social and the cultural. Because in 1917, the Bolshevist Revolution takes place. In 1920, around 1920, you know, you have two individuals who come from Ireland to India. I am referring to James Cousins and Margaret Cousins at the invitation of Annie Besant. When we are reading Life Divine, should we not read about Annie Besant and about James Cousins and Margaret Cousins? Surely. Because among the sketches that the mother has done in 1920 is that of James Cousin. And Shorabindo was reviewing the book, New Ways in the English Literature, and he very soon very abandons the idea of the review and writes a completely original book for the future. So you can see that the coming together and the convergence of this intellectual, great intellectual. It was very well said in the preceding session that when he's a spiritual thinker, but he's also an intellectual. By talking about the spiritual greatness of an individual, we do not really annul the intellectual contribution. And the 20th century is preeminently an intellectual. Your window has to make sense to the intellectual audience. Because that is a yoga dharma, that is the spirit of the times. So there is a time, it was a time when Ramakrishna Paramahansa was important. And the difference between Shorabindo and Swami Vivekananda, and Shorabindo was greatly influenced by Swami Vivekananda. In the evening talks with Purani, somebody is asking, did you see Swami Vivekananda? He said, Vivekananda came and met me in the prison and he put here. So did you see him? Yes, yes, I saw him as I am seeing now. And Vivekananda taught me in the secrets of the soul. But something which happened in an unprecedented manner to Swami to sure when that did not happen to Vivekananda because when Vivekananda passed away, despite all his great contribution, less than 40. And Sri Aurobindo witnessed the first world war and the second world war. And he was witness to the emergence, the rise of the cold war. And he's written the post chapter in the idea of moon. An extraordinary thing to happen. Because he's a witness to world events of this kind which shakes the human conscience because there is nothing that has happened like the Holocaust which takes place. Six millions of the Jews have been killed and gassed to death. And along with that, you know, you have the Gulag archipelago of the Stalinistic prison system. So I think 20th century, we have to understand. And this is the kind of age, the context in which the light divine has very important to bear in mind. Those are the important reference points. The Spanish Civil War, the World War II, the Holocaust, the Gulag Archipelago. Shorabindo had all those things at the back of his mind when he was talking about it. As a, he was writing the arrival of a new dawn. Not like a utopian thinker who has nothing to do with time, but somebody who is present in his chamber is monitoring the progress of the World War II. And he says that now this man is going to stand up and fight, and he was referring to church. And he was talking about the Battle of Britain. Britain. And he says that, you know, the German Luftwaffe is going to be defeated. And he was defeated. Because Hitler had said by the 15th of August, remember 15th of August, the birthday, birth anniversary of sure. 15th of August, Hitler claimed and goading the head of the Air Force, German Air Force head. I will plant the German flag on the, in the Parliament House. And he says there is going to be another defeat. He was not a general, 
He said, he is going to meet his own water. And that water was coming. The entire German Fifth Army was surrounded by the Russians. And that was the turning point of the retreat of the, of the Germans and the advancement of Eisenhower's forces and the discovery of the concentration camps. So we have to remember that. George Window was concretely aware of the fate of humanity. And he had a certain unflinching faith in the future of humanity, which is heralded in life. So it's not utopia as a kind of a moonshine and non existent thing. A creation of Thomas More's utopia, or the utopia of D.H. Lawrence and Brannan in, in, in Florida, as it was imagined. But it is a kind of a utopia based on the concrete experience of the human evil of the Hobbesian kind, poor brutish nasty breath. That is a kind of Hobbesian notion, definition of humanity. And he had the Vivekananda's definition of the human nature like a dog's tail. It is proverbial crooked, crooked, and it comes back, literally and probably a crooked, and it comes back, human nature. And here is somebody who is seeing the transformation of the human in the life divine. It begins with human aspiration, and there is a dialectic that you find in life and ends with the divine life. And in between, there are so many chapters, and our own friends are going to do justice to those chapters. The nature of evil, for example. The triple transformation is done. And you find a, a remarkable parallel of life divine in the human cycle as well as the synthesis of yoga. Because synthesis of uh, yoga is a, offers a blueprint and a manifesto of actual transformation of our own being itself. So it's not some moonshine that has been talked about, but a path, a concrete and organized path. Yoga, discovery of the inner world, inner life. What I can experiment, experience, you can also do that through the process of yoga, because yoga is in here. Nineteen forty-five, the Cold War and the United Nations organized. And Shorabindo says, on the one hand, life divine and the simpler yoga, an attempt to write Savitri about love and death, which had its genesis in the Baroda. Genealogy is very important in Shorabindo. And the UN. And today we are talking about the monopolistic character of the Security Council. Shorabindo is saying that you know, the division of the world into two blocks, an exercise of the power by a monopolistic block is going to really hamper the function of the United Nations. And we have just had the instance, a paradoxical instance of a major superpower, which has been accused of genocide and has been vetoing, for example, anything. Projecting the United Nations as a toothless tiger, because of its inability to implement the decisions of the General Assembly in one voice, for example. It was not a crystal place. He did not make any kind of projections. He said, I look at the world in terms of possibilities and the configuration of the process. It may or may not happen. He's not a magician. Much depends on the ability to collaborate of the enlightened humanity. Arnold Toynbee talks about the dominant minorities, intelligence, the awakened minority among the human beings who are. Can they really cooperate? As the mother says, the world is preparing for a big change. Will you help? And then, of course, the definition, and today in the Preceding session, we have talked about the, the absolute being, the Brahman, and the ability to go beyond the dualities and the polarizations and binaries. But Shorabindo offers in a philosophical terms, mother offers in very simple manner. And I've never forgotten mother's definition of the divine. It says when you are conscious of the whole world at the same time, you can be conscious of the absolute being, the Brahman that your window is talking about in the life. We have had the Cold War, 
and the inter-assigned rivalry and the ethnic bloodletting of Rwanda and Burundi and others. And short Bindo's life divine continues to be remote in this kind of person. And I was just telling our friends about the upsurge of violence in Ukraine and the savagery and the barbarism and the kind of a genocide that is taking place. How do you look at short Bindo's life divine in this kind of person? As Marx said, people have, you know, Angel Marx and Angel said, people have talked about, thinkers have talked about the nature of the life. What is important is to change it. And we have this notion of the dreamers and the actors. We have this notion of Swami Vivekananda as an actor and Ramakrishna Paramahansa as a thinker, as a visionary. May I say to this learned experience, to God gathering and audience, was both a vision, visioner as well as a doer. He had no illusions about the nature of the human, nature of the human. And yet he gave before us a blueprint for actual transformation. But this transformation required certain prerequisites. And unless we really pay heed to those requisites, I'm afraid we will not do justice to the nature of the transformation that he is talking. <clears throat> there are today, if you look at and beyond this whole question of the genocide and the violence, and we just had two days back the unfortunate killing of 18 children in Mandar State. Beyond the question of violence that is being meted out to the environment, the ecology, and Ashish Nandi talks about science hegemony and violence, how the Western violence has a scientific temper is embedded in a spirit of violence. Not avoid, but perpetuating violence on all that it visits, including the inanimate nature. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking more fundamentally about what really, you know, what we witness today and what it is that we can do in the context of the life we have. There are two questions that we must relentlessly ask. Two questions. Why? And how? Why life divine now? And how can we really think of the principles of life? Which are not just going to be a kind of utopian project like Thomas More's and others. We need to revisit life divine friends in this context by having an awareness of the world events, awareness of the contribution of the major thinkers and philosophers that such had talked about. The rise of logical positivity, the rise of the different epistemologies, including Derrida and you know others, for example, the deconstructions, the postmodern school, the structuralists, the post structure Otherwise, we'll be at fault of having an approach which is not historicized, not contextual. Sure, Bindo has to be seen in the, against the intellectual history of the West, and we must have, at least at the back of our mind, all the thoughts and the contributions which have been made. Also, due to paucity of time and the format of a seminar, including a kind of a plenary session, for example, many of these things have to be really narrow. But they must be there. Those references points must be there at the back. Shiorbindo did not have access to a battery of the secretaries there and research scholars. Very often we have research scholars also. We have libraries, we have encyclopedias. Shiorbindo did not have access to this research. He just lived in one room and it was aptly described as the cave of his tapasya. And he wrote with such phenomenal memory. And it begins in the ideal of humanity that turn towards the unity's necessity and difference. He's all the time qualifying his things. He never makes generalizations. He says, I see a possibility, but you may not really move in that direction. And in life divine, exactly that is what he says. When he's talking about the human aspiration, he's not talking about Hindu aspiration or Muslim aspiration or the Abrahamic aspiration. He's talking about the human aspiration. But the human aspiration does not annul 
जो जुडाई के एस्पिरेशन डज नॉट एन दिन ये दो एस्पिरेशन इट एम्ब्रेसेस द बेस्ट एस्पेक्ट्स दैट एम्ब्रेस दैट्स व्हाई व्हेन ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट द फोर मेजर वर्ल्ड इवेंट्स इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस ही फर्स्ट पिक्स अप द ट्रोजन वॉर ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट द ट्रेजेडी ऑफ ट्रॉय फर्स्ट and the aims with the mahabharata the teaching of the god krishna on the battlefields of the mahabharata my friends can we think of the mahabharata without the bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita is an essence and crystallization of the entire wisdom that underlies the mahabharata world. and in terms of the history of consciousness he says that the krishna consciousness you know is an advancement to the rama consciousness because for him rama as he explains in the essence of the gita represents the human mind at its acme the culmination of the human mind and the four kinds of dilemmas that that met ram lord ram the great maryadya purush he could be or some of this and arjuna in the battlefield and i think it's important to also refer to the battle of kurukshetra to bhagavad gita because among the epitaphs the epigraphs that sri aurobindo has written vedas upanishads and bhagavad gita bhagavad gita's epigraphs are very much there as important epigraphs to the chapters of the library okay to go to you know all the laws of the kinsman take shelter in me i am going to tell you because you have the vanity and the ahankar that kundan ji has spoken about as part of her own tradition you think that you are going to slay they have been slain in the subtle world you have the arrogance to think that you are the doer you have the vanity that you are going to really kill look at me and then he says universe after universe and we are remembered of j oppenheimer in the new mexican desert he was fashioning the nuclear weapon and jay weapon hymers book i got in the new york university outside the new york university outside the mit and the harvard university brighter than thousands the lines from bhagavad j open hand the architect of the nuclear and somebody who differed from the american military industrial complex and he was persecuted bhagavad gita and the learning and the wisdom of of what of the krishna consciousness ability to go beyond the mind are we being confined to life divine should we not talk about the essence of the gita should we not talk about the jero von heimer should we not talk about the holocaust everything comes together as the impulse to have him repeat when we cry it is the power of imagination and the ability to connect aspects and references which are considered to be you know disparate they have to be brought together what remains to be done in this presentation are two four one i'm going to look very closely although sure we have said we create the habit the habit of dissecting things looking at issues in snippets in terms of education what i think the methodology the logical and the systematic way way of really arriving at the kind of formula is very also sure window is really suggesting and advocating the need to go beyond it but we need to be in the rationality before you think of going beyond the rational beyond the logical sure window was deeply concerned deeply in, you know invested in the rational part otherwise you wouldn't have written 25 and so many volumes he would have written because he says that all knowledge came to him and it begins with uttara para speech and the great sense of vacuum that is there and the great fear and the trauma for a thinker to see that no words come to my mind i'm standing here i'm standing with a paper sure we did not have a paper before him in the uttara para speech when he was talking about the greatness of the sanatana dharma that religion which happens to be in the indian in the territory in the in the geographical domain calling it he did not have a paper like me he didn't have an ipad he spoke and there was a vacuum 
and the greatest spying by fear that is there and the trauma before a thinker is to be speechless actually, not to have an iPad, not to have a book. And the Arya period, Barin Ghosh writes that when he goes and sees that he stood and he sat for an iPad and he was thinking. The kind of a silence that my preceding speaker had talked about, how the mind has to be like a stillness, water of a lake. So the, the best wisdom which can come from the over mind, I have over mind and intuitional things can go down. And you can, we can become, we can generalize to create great, great realm thoughts and insights and wisdom from the great. So I'm going to really tell you about this daily reading. It's extraordinary to look very closely at the way and the two chapters that he's talked about. The materialist denial and the ascetic view. And for my purpose, I think it's very useful to take one or two chapters and to do just. I mean, I'm temperamentally, I'm not an element of a mega project. I think of the opening, I think of the ending. And Frank Cornwood, the eminent literary critic, has also written a very fine descriptive sense of an ending. Endings are very important. Openings are very important. As a literary scholar, I'm very fascinated by the manner in which, for example, openings are done in the writings. It's not accident. And the ending, for example, it opens with the human aspiration and it ends with divine life. And in between, there are all these things. So the essential truth you have the two epigraphs. One is a Taitriya Upanishad, and second is also another, you know, sort of a quotation from another Upanishad that he gives in the two chapters. It is the, there are certain assumptions that he is making, but there is no duplication, there is no replication. He's not saying that this is there and the rest of the things are all elaborate. No, they're not elaborate. Each time you revisit the concept in Shwarabindo, is coming up with greater you know, effulgence of the truth and the insights in the manner in which it was not hitherto, hitherto encountered. So binaries and exclusivity between Western materialism and Eastern asceticism, the path of the materialist and the hedonist and the epicurean and the path of the anchorite, dramatized, in polarized thoughts. But friends, if you look very closely, can you say that materialism is a monopoly of the West and asceticism is a monopoly of the East? You have to think of the word that Shardinda uses in the, in the life divine. G-N-O-S-I-S, And for supermind to consciousness, Gnostic thing. The term which has been used in the context of an institution which is still doing very well in, in Delhi, the Gnostic sense. The Gnostics are the Greeks. The Greeks have a kind of mystical tradition of the Gnostics. The Egyptian Book of the Dead also refers to the Gnostics, also to the mysteries of the Pharaohs. And then, of course, St. Augustine, the city of God of St. Augustine. And of course, the Christian mystics. <laughs> and in India, you simply have to read the foundations of Indian culture to know. The great experiments in material culture of Vikramaditya and others also. So it's not East and West polarized terms, but for the sake of argument, of course, preeminence. Predominant versions of the experiment nature has carried out in the East, material, materialistic. The preeminent kind of an experiment, because he says, I mean, if you look at Shurabin, though, he says, the drive of nature and capital. Nature pushes one kind of an argument to its own logical kind of an experiment and then leaves it there. And the next century also, another kind of an experiment is there. Liberty. As the base of the pyramid in the French Revolution, an entire you know, era passes. And with the, you know, the 
the sanguine nature of the French Revolution, which drops your analysis. And then, of course, another kind of an experiment with equality as the basis. And Shardbindo says this internecine kind of a battle between the liberty and equality, the reconciliation and the compatibility could be found only on the basis of fraternity. And fraternity is the call of power. And true comradeship, comradeship of the heart at the soul level. The ideal of humanity he talks about the religion of humanity with our capital. And it is this religion of humanity that is also talked about in the life. When you are thinking of the change of the essential change of consciousness. But I am sidestepping, I'm going further, I'm taking certain leaps. I must really come back to the central argument that of the privacy theory. So the line, so what you have, what happens is that there are two primary and possible ways of bringing about a luminous reconciliation. An objective method of analysis. The second is a subjective synthesis and a Catholic affirmation, a manifold conflicting forces. Using the language of paradox that we see in William Blake, for example, and the road to excess leads to the palace of wisdom, William Blake. And Shorbindo was all the time using the mystical language of paradoxes, like William Blake. And no wonder that Blake was considered to be a madman, because insanity is a kind of an epithet, an attribute given by mankind to individuals who are supremely capable and who have the kind of insights which are not available. We love that. So Shurabindu says, is thinking of the example of how is how is that you know materialism has its own contents, its own answer in the seed form. He says, look at agnosticism, for example. Agnosticism doesn't say that, you know, truth doesn't, uh, T, capital, and God doesn't exist. Agnosticism says that God may or may not exist, but I have no way of proving the existence of God, in contrast to atheism. And says, agnosticism also is a kind of acknowledgement of the unknowable, possibility of the unknowable. So the unknowable is not really left out of the reckoning. The unknowable is very much there. So the fact that the unknowable is there itself, it indicates to us the possibility of realizing the unknown. What then is the, the, the service of atheism and agnosticism? It is to envisage the possibility of realizing the unknown. In the light of the above, we can resolve the ongoing conflict, he says, by postulating the following. And this proposition was advanced, is advanced again and again in short process. And which is going to really acknowledge the fact of not the relative significance of the phenomenal existence, but the absolute significance of the phenomenal existence. It is not the absolute significance of the absolute being, such as another, but God, which has been created because of the Leela of the desire for self-manifestation. This reality, and it says, the touch of the earth is invigorating to the sons of the earth. So Kama, Artha, Dharma, Moksha. Moksha is not the ultimate thing. Kama and Artha are important in themselves. They're not of relative importance. They're of absolute importance. This is the major kind of a departure that you find in Shorabindo vis-a-vis the earlier tradition. Material culture, the matter, the body, for example. The body is not a source of embarrassment. The body is not to be modified. The body is not to be tortured. The body is to be transformed. The transformation, the embracing of the body, the celebration of the body. Didn't Sri Mindra say that the Swarist was a mystic, was missed his way? Because we are worshipping the body, the body is to be worshipped. But the body is not to be worshipped as an end in sense. The body is to be worshipped in the context of the fivefold order that was spoken of in the previous session. The worshipping, the acknowledgement of the body and the bodily existence, the material existence, he says, is something very important. And to my mind, this is an advancement to what we find elsewhere in the Indian tradition, 
the ascetic and the life denying tradition. The flight to the Himalayas, to the hills, the abjuring of the women as Kamini and Kanchana that Ramakrishna Paraman says talked about. The objectification of sexuality in women, which has done enormous harm to our own culture and tradition. And gold and women have been objectified by the patriarchal imagination and wrongfully so. And we must understand why it is that the subjugation of the women, etc., have taken place in our own country. It is because of the kind of metaphysics that we have created, the way of looking at the world. We have to read Simon de Beauvoir's second sense to understand how, for example, the creation myth has been in patriarchy. Shorabindo is saying that it's very important to think of the change and transformation of the material existence on egalitarian terms in terms of the gender relationship also. What is surpassed? Again, something very interesting that you find in Shorabindo. What you find, and this is also something which is a recurrent kind of a film. Between 5 and 15 minutes, I promise that I will end in time. I do hope that there will be question answers also, five or 10 minutes question answer. What is the seminar without question answers? And with it, what is the seminar with a monologue? You know, there has to be dialogue. We're talking about pluralism all the time, <laughs> but you know, we talk about monologue. So what you find extraordinary, and in this chapter also you find, both the chapters you find, when something is taken up, taken to a higher level, for example, the Lord does not feel, does not disappear. In the history of the emergence of the animal world also, you only find dinosaurs disappear. But you don't find the human species disappearing, you don't find the apes disappear. Of course, you might say that we have not found the missing link between the ape consciousness and the human consciousness. And the episode in the life divine when Shorabindo is talking about the radical change in the transformation from the ape to the human consciousness. Imagine an assembly of the apes. And each, you know, heaping praise on each other. Can we ever find such a creature with a wonderful tail, for example, jumping from it? There is going to be another species very soon. One of the apes intelligent apes says, it will not have our own tail, but it will have a faculty to really think of flying in the air and going under the sea. Everybody laughs. And Shorabindo says in the life divine, and this is at the heart of this duality between materialist denial and ascetic self. Just as it is impossible for a person in the egg consciousness to think of the human consciousness. According to the drive of nature and evolution, it will be equally impossible for human consciousness the human mind, which is at the summit, for example, to think of the supramental or the supranational world. What is intuition? If it is not flashes of wisdom and insights which are coming from superior organs, we accept intuition. But we haven't found any way of perpetuating intuition as a way of our own lives. Shorabindo is giving a promise of the possibility of perpetuation of those forces, those states of being like which are beyond the rationality, but maybe it may accept the best of the intelligent and enlightened reason and enlightened rationality. So reason doesn't go away, Shorjito says. Ego was the helper. Ego is the power. Reason was the helper. Reason is the power. In the human cycle, he says, office and limitation of reasons. Turn towards unity is necessity and need. Constantly qualifying these statements. And going beyond this question of truth versus falsehood, he doesn't think about truth and falsehood. He doesn't really operate in those binaries. And that is why I think it is not easy and convenient for the human mind to reach out. Because we are used to our own habitual way of thinking. When we are reading a text and a thinker, we are trying to put that thinker in our own slot that we have created for ourselves. And Shorabindo defies of being put any to, into any kind. That's a radical and revolutionary nature. He's constantly qualified and telling us. So the materialist denial, as he says, 
And of course, certain kind of fruit is there. And he says, the desire, and he gives an example, wonderful example, one of these things. And you know, I'm advisedly departing because it's more exciting to speak and what to read. He giving the example of the wireless telegram, you know, as a possibility. It says matter is not just heat, you know, inanimate. Matter is energy, and energy is consciousness. So the movement of matter is matter, is not inanimate. It is alive, it is throbbing, subatomic level. It is responsive to the caress, to the touch, to the respect, and to the veneration I'm making as I am sitting and speaking here and speaking here because it is rendering you know, signal service to me. I must really defy this, this, this platform, this dies. It is throbbing with me. We have to wait till Jagdish Chandra goes to come and say that plants are also have life. And the great romantic thinker, Madame the Science, said in romantic thinkers, that what's what says, I'm lost in the tree. The barrier between myself and the tree had broken down in the British romanticists. Shodhindu is talking about that. Matter is an expression. Nature. Energy is nothing but an expression of consciousness. Giving the example of wireless telegraph. One point of transmission, another point of distribution. This example is also precursor of the fact that there may come a time when both the transmission and the reception, points of transmission and the points of reception will go. That's the argument. The advent of wireless telegraph is affirmation of the fact that battery is energy and energy is culture. And this idea, this seed idea, are latent in the great lesson of consciousness. We have to rediscover. He's all the time talking about rediscovering our own ancient wisdom. When William Archer wrote that through the, the spring and said Indian culture and its future, world's future. And the great Tantri scholars, and we are so lucky to have two great Tantri scholars. It's a great poverty of my own learning that I do not have the access to some people. Uh, Professor Sampadana Mishra and Professor As a gateway to our own knowledge. That Kundalini rediscovered, discovered, but rediscovered, and to use it in our own time, the modern, the contemporary. So at the end, you find there is a reconciliation. It is a luminous reconciliation. It's not a state of uneasy kind of balance, a true reconciliation between the spirit of man. And the spirit of accident. It's not accidental. I do not find that it is accidental. It is immediately after, after the human activity. And after that, of course, the omnipresent. And then many other chapters also. But the first two or three chapters, to my mind, as a teacher, as a writer, are very important. If a writer doesn't succeed in his mission or her mission in the first two chapters, that writer will not be read for the rest of the book. So if you look at even from the point of view of the writing, the style itself, and the last paragraph, he says, you know, when he talks about the fourfold, you know, the most important aspiration of humankind, God, light, freedom, immortality. Not even the most skeptical age can really banish those thoughts and extremism. And then he, of course, the last paragraph becomes that. We have, we, we have dreamed about this. The time is perhaps come to realize, to see the possibility of their own realization in terms of their time. And then in between, of course, the discussion, the intellectual discussion in logical and rational terms, for example. <coughs> And of 
course, there is always the kind of an invocation of the higher realms of the Vedas, the Upanishad. And he says, Vedanta, the original Vedanta, that is the, the answers and the roots of answers and the, you know, the, the solutions, the luminous solutions. At this stage, we must really come to the last part. Why is there a persistence between materialism and asceticism? There is a persistence. If you see, look at the mainstream society in India, for example, you know, the scramble for Skumbamela, the desire to know, for example, whether a temple existed or a mosque existed, for example, even as we speak in the courts of India that have been talked about. The great passion of the different religious groups, the Hindus, the Muslims, and the Christians. And sure, Vito was always talking about the going, you know, gradual disappearance of the religion. Religion as an organized way of looking at our relationship with God. Religion in terms of dogma and ceremonies and cults. My friends, if you look at the mainstream society, is religion going away? I think religion has been consolidated more and more. Is caste going away? Even in the context of the corporate culture, caste is still, you know, raising its hydra head at one as a hydra head. So religion has not gone away. The religious right in the America, in the United States, in North America has not gone away. Why is that? This religious instinct has not gone away. Why is that in terms of the materialism? Today, materialism of the earlier kind may have gone away. But when Shorbindo was talking about energy and consciousness, who would imagine that, in the, at least in the intellectual, enlightened intellectual circles, people will talk about you know, as, as materialism as a thing of the past. But today, we have cultural materialism. The avant-garde universities in, in North America and elsewhere, and their own counterparts in India, thinking about the and to my mind, materialism is important. Because the vast parts of humanity and mankind throughout the world in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Indian subcontinent, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, are still steeped in poverty. They do not have the basic, basic comforts of health, nutrition. Forget about the kind of air condition hall in which this deliberation is. I think when Shor Bindo was talking about the changes taking place in the race with art gallery, he did not have the dominant minority of Arnold Toynbee being in mind. He had the majority of the population. And we must remember what Shor Bindo said about the basic equality and absolute equality. And he said absolutely equality is not possible because human beings are endowed with different attitudes. Therefore, society respects individuals based on their own. But basic equality, he says, absolutely sine qua non. It's an absolute need. And no wonder the UN Charter, Charter of Heavens, talked about it. the right to education, the right of the children, the right of the indigenous people. It's not accident. So, in a certain fundamental and cardinal manner, I think those international bodies are affirming the truth that you have been asked of. We must read the last, you know, one, one or two chapters of the very neglected book, which is which should be a companionable book because every book of Shurpindo is complementary to the other. In both the sense of CM, PLE, and DIY, COM, PLI, complementary. What on self And he's talking about the importance of self how was a child perceived in the patriarchal mode as an extension of my own being itself? What I want to do, I want to do with my child. My failed, experience, failed ex in my expectations, my frustrations, I must fulfill through my child. Child in the patriarchy, nature in the idea, and self-determination is important because the inanimate nature and the world of nature have their own fate and destiny, and human beings, and we must really, you know, equal, sure, Ashish Nandi's science, hegemony, and violence. 
we have no business to perpetuate, to perpetuate violence even on nature. Just as we have no business to perpetuate and perpetuate violence to the children and women and the minorities. That is a radical nature of shame in the war and self-determination, the chapter called self-determination. And the spirit of self-determination is very much embedded in the life matter, spirit, vital, the mental, the supermental. Evolution is possible only if you posit the importance, the inevitability of involution. It is involved. Matter comes out of life because life is involved in matter. And mind comes out of life because life is involved, mind is involved in life. And can there be no other possibility? Can we in our own arrogance say that, you know, mind is the summit of all evolution? It is not. So my friends, to round it off, I think materialism is important to my mind. This is my little understanding. The persistence of materialism and material culture, because vast masses of our population are still deprived and still steeped in malnutrition. That lack of health and basic material needs and comforts that only elites in different societies. And religion is equally important as long as that need is not really saturated. Religion will remain. But as Sri says very memorably, apes will remain. The arrival of the human species has not annulled ended the existence of the apes. And as he explains to us, the arrival of another species called the supramental race will not really know the end of the human species as we understand. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, enlightening us on uh, the Sri Aurobindo's philosophy and especially uh, laying out uh, and stressing upon the overlap between Sri Aurobindo's philosophy and the Western. Uh, philosophers and thinkers like uh, William Blake uh, and Simon de Bois and William Wordsworth. And uh, you also mentioned the departures uh, from those philosophy that the uh, Western models have. So thank you so much again. And now I would like to ask the participants uh, and our uh, invited speaker. I'm sure you have some observations to make surely. It's a really, really enlightening question to us. And uh, one uh, aspect you explained about Sri Ravindo, that uh, he also defies that tradition, and that's why we are not able to grasp him, and many people do not uh, study him. But I feel for the last uh, some years, I'm studying the teachings of Sri Ravindo every day, or part of my uh, education. I feel that. Uh, what is uh, being denied, what is being said in that way, uh, is something that we are not exposing our education, educated class or intellectuals to do Sri Aurobindo's writings. Somewhere there is some kind of mysticism uh, which is enveloping the uh, approach itself. So, what you uh, question is that uh, how can you, what kind of ways and means we adopted so that more and more people can understand this? I feel that. Reading Sri Aurobindo's intellectual capacity. And if we are denying our new generation from the writings of Sri Aurobindo, due to any reason, whether it is the English of Sri Aurobindo, whether it is mysticism uh, and the long for phrases or other things, then uh, there's something a uh, kind of disgrace to the nation and a great injustice to the new generation. What is the way out? I think you have hit the nail on the head. I think I really welcome this question from you. I mean, you are very much like a member of the younger generation. And there are students in this very university, Gurukul University, Professor Mishra, who will also sort of encounter this kind of a situation. So we have to really provide answers. What is the answer? Is the answer, please visit. Is the answer that, you know, the question Professor Singh was that uh, poses a certain degree of difficulty to window. And it also involves a kind of an intellectual effort. Yeah. Should the majority of our own country student population? Denied from that. 
pure learning they should not be. So I think the answer that I have found as an education is to think about fundamental changes in our education system. Because the reference points are not just. I mean, I taught in an elite university, which has just been given you know, the tag of an eminent institution with eminence, with 1,000 crores by the HRD ministry. And it was my great consternation that my students had no idea about the world. They had no idea of the Spanish Civil War. And yet, they were required to understand about the experiments of Pablo Picasso. Now, I asked them, do you have you read Guerrilla? No, they haven't heard about Berenica. Now, my knowledge, I mean, the reading that I did in the Ashram School, the Center of Education, much depends on the receptivity. Some of my own friends were also having long siesta in the afternoon when I would find myself in the night. My job, my job. You can go to the same school, you can go to the same church and come back. The first year that you are talking about is very important for when you're talking about Guru Kulash, I think that has to be a kind of stage in your life when you devote yourself to learning. My friend, the first book that I learned in an institution which is really devoted to Indian thought, in traditions like the Vedas and the Upanishad, the first Mishra is very interesting. The first book that I read was The Legends of Greece and Rome. That was the gateway to the Western tradition. Very important. Do our own students know about Greece and Rome? They don't know. Until 1980, when I used to come and wish my friends Merry Christmas, it is a religion of the Christians. Today, because of the corporate culture, you know, Christmas has been accepted in our own cause because merry making, you know, enjoyment and cake cutting, etc. But how many people realize the value of it, of, it, of Christ? I'm not diverging, diverging but I'm giving you some central about the learning that should be done at the lower level. Exposure to the best thoughts, which are important, which are multi-religious, which are multicultural, which are multi-ethnic, very, very important. In Pondicherry recently, you know, I was giving a kind of a talk, you know, online talk. There was a person who was helping me, and she was a Roman Catholic. She said, I'm an RC. I said, what is our sin? She said, Roman Catholic. I said, by the way, I accept the teaching of Jesus Christ. Telling you. The way of learning, for example, I mean, it cannot be done just before the UPSC interview. Such learning is absolutely bogus and worthless learning. And such bureaucrats are also no good. Because it cannot be through this kind of a PhD approach learning, you know, go to Bajram or some kind of an institute, coaching institute, and you learn and become a bureaucrat or you become a professor. No, years of learning, right from the school itself. So this girl told me, she said, are you an RC? I said, no, I'm not an RC, but I believe I accept the Jesus Christ because he symbolizes the spirit of sacrifice. I said, I have to be a kind of a Christian to, be, to accept the best teachings of Jesus Christ. I don't have to be a giant to understand the greatness of God. So, my friend, I mean, I think here is a very learned, you know, a leading body, very important body. I mean, we have all these bodies. I think what this body should do is to create and to promote international education. Not just nativistic and a revivalist education. The greatness of our own tradition is to be realized with regard to the traditions of the other lands. Isn't it said? In future poetry, I was really struck by what you have been in future poetry. And he says, we, we discover the greatness of our own world when we visit other lands. When we visit other lands. And the last chapter of the foundations of Indian culture is a very important chapter. Indian culture and external influence. So my friends, such education should begin from the beginning itself. If we have divested, we have denied the children of the education of the East and the West, of the Assyrian culture, the Egyptian culture, the Chinese culture, do you think it will be easy? 
when they join, for example, the program of comparative religion and comparative studies at the elite universities, then we are not very to the children. I think the problem lies not with the children. The problem lies with our own education. And I'm suggesting, and I'm glad that the government of the day is aware as conscious of the need for and the abolition of the streaming between arts and science. Why should we really compel everybody to read biology? They might read by elementary biology. And when my sire sit for the entrance exam of the medical sciences, if they qualify so good, they would have taken a combination of music and biology and literature and some other subjects also. So I think we, they will be the gainer if they are given this kind of a holistic and integrated education, which I think the children like to learn. And if you're talking about Shurmindo's language, one thing, cadences. You know, it's like appreciating Indian music, for example. Can we appreciate Indian music? Give a, give a very crude example of some drink sauce. I mean, my sister said first time she tasted champagne, it really tasted very bitter. But you have to develop a habit of really appreciating champagne also. Nothing comes easy. We have to make an effort. And once you are in it, you know, I mean, Sarod or Sitar or Indian music or whatever, we have to make a little effort. But what, once you are inside, then obviously, you know, you, once you taste it, the real stuff, you will not be interested in the make believe or, you know, the studious ones. So that's my answer. I think the problem lies not with you. But the kind of an educational system that you have got. And hopefully, before we pass away from the earth, and I think our own children should have access to it. Learning of multiple sources, learning of different streams and disciplines, which is missing right now. Not even the Dole School is teaching them that. And they have to go to some coaching centers to learn the basic rudiments of our tradition. Which is, I think, it is a very sad situation. Any other? Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. A few things. One is the Aurobindo journey to the context of. Utopia also, we know about the path to living utopia. Contemporary thinkers, in a way, we can relate to the Aurobindo journey the spirit of living utopia. But living utopia is also an acknowledgement of living. Most of the Aurobindo's, our interpretation of Aurobindo seems to acknowledge the element of acknowledgement of the things. How do we really engage with evil no, with uh, Sri Aurobindo? And then, for example, most of the people in what's uh, in terms of intuition, the Aurobindo is not against intuition. That is also part of a uh, very wide uh, investment of this investment. And uh, the intuition, for example, in the phenomenological network, one also with a homeless thing. Transversal, like the history of Aurobindo studies, which is a continued invitation. For example, about consciousness, Edmond Husserl. And there is also there is the attention to intuition. In Jan 1, the writing of Edmond Husserl also just declared living intuition. 
So therefore, how do we really, as you say, how do we really create intuition? You say perpetuate intuition, and which we can also say circles of intuition. We part methodology to do that. Because in terms of our methodologies of knowledge, what is still missing is that really creating intuition is also a source. And some of us individually get a glimpse of that. But in part, are about Gnostic element. There are because so much people are Gnostic. There, the Gnostic is, so it relates to the big tradition. It is also part of a wider human. The query is that how do you relate uh, the Gnostic in the big tradition to Gnosis in the Vedic tradition? And also, the great tradition of Gnostic tradition in Europe, for example, Goethe, one uh, very important uh, co thinker would be Goethe, who also really built art, dirt, art and science and poetry together in such an effortless way as part of an unity of I think uh, I'm, Ananda, you uh, asked a uh, uh, very insightful, you made some insightful observations, but not queries, but observations, and very important ones. The first is, Shwetminder is not the only one to talk about utopia, living utopia. There are others also who have talked about it. And the question is, can we learn from those experiments in conceptual terms and practical terms? My answer is a resounding yes. We have to learn. And sure, Pindu is also engaging. You know, when he's talking about, when he's answering Mutilal Roy, I think there is a need for a reservoir of knowledge of sure, Pindu's biography and his biography and the writings also. When he's writing to Mutilal Roy, He's saying that Paul and Mira Richard are not the usual theosophists. And there is a full essay that he's written about it and about Madame Brothers. So I'm not suggesting any kind of, you know, that he had an exclusive understanding that other people do not have. I think that would be doing disservice to the spirit of Shorbi, Shorbi Kanan, and Mothers. That is a very exclusivist kind of an approach. Shorbi says that. We must really see what he said. He said, he said, I have always been struck by that line of story. He said, I am not here to gather disciples. I have discovered a certain truth for myself. There are others, if others benefit, others feel that they can benefit. They are welcome to God. I mean, this is so different from all of us. I mean, if I give a talk in my class, I mean, the student doesn't say that you know, it was a great talk. I mean, I probably, uh, I, mean, I feel completely a little doubted for that day. And here is your view of spending 20, 30 minutes of his life in his couple's He's not He's not saying that what I have said, other people have to say. Nothing. So the answer is a resounding yes. We have to learn from the different experiments. And the reason for it, the Bolshevist experiment, we have to see why it failed. It had a wonderful kind of opinion, and its goals were so good, equality. But why did it get trapped in the dictatorship of the politics? Why did it not really envisage us becoming of a classless society? We have to learn from them. We cannot learn by becoming a diehard Marxist and say that, you know, what we have said is absolutely right. No. And we just remove all the, you know, the dissident thinkers as renegades, for example. Never. So freedom is so important to show. Freedom of thought and the freedom of thought. So that is the answer to the first question. The second question is intuition. <clears throat> In short, Hindu is the only person talking about intuition. He's talking about, I mentioned about the romantics, British romantics, for example. An auxiliary line came, light came from the setting sun. An auxiliary light came from the setting sun. Auxiliary light comes and enters into me. And therefore, I am completely transformed. Prelude. The subtitle is the birth of the poet's mind. 
and nothing of what's going to be done. The identification part between the subjective self and the objective reality. The disappearance of the subject object dichotomy, for example, which you find in British romantics. A Schlering, German, and Schlegel, for example, and Madame de Stael. There's a whole tradition behind that. I think Shorabindo is also making use of that tradition when he's writing. And he's so well read. And we have a very eminent Tagorean sitting here. You know, we have our friend here, and he will agree. That Tagore won't have been the same unless he had had an exposure to Europe and to the West. Shantiniket, Vishwabharati, the world in earnest. Remarkable figure that I have not seen. And Gotunda will agree with me. An extraordinary figure and multi talented, versatile genius like Tagore. India has produced very few like Tagore. So I have the greatest kind of esteem and respect for the intuition. And there is a you know exchange between Dilip Kumar Roy and Shurabindo about Tagore's history, for example, the spiritual side and the mystical side. He says it could be because of some exigencies of publication that such a thing is being done. But Tagore for him remains mystic and a spiritual. That is an answer. That you know, intuition is very much. Uh, you know, part of a legacy and a tradition in the West and the East. I agree with you. The Gnostic tradition existed, not only in ancient Greece, but in medieval Europe also. It is important to really learn from that tradition. When we're talking about the contextual reading, very often we don't do it. I mean, we're talking about future poetry, and we don't even read James Cousin, Margaret Cousins. We don't read Paul Richard. And we are so narrow and exclusive in our own approach. How many of us read Shorabindo and Ramakrishnan Paramahansa and Swami Vivekananda in the same manner? Kundan Singh was telling us about the different kinds of divisions and denominations in Hinduism and Indian, Indian tradition. Very often, you know, sort of our hindrances in our own path. We simply say that Shorabindo, of course, was greatly influenced by Swami Vivekananda, but you have to engage with Swami Vivekananda. We have to read the entire, you know, brotherhood of the of the of the, of the disciples, Vivekananda and his disciples. It's a wonderful book that I read. And Sister Nivedita, his Sister Nivedita accepted, acknowledged in the pantheon of the the Ramakrishna mission. No. Sister Nivedita at one time, the beginning of the 20th century, was completely negated, denigrated by the missionary order. And there is a Sister Nivedita school now. Nuns are separate from the monks. So has Sister Nivedita received my own childhood to answer my friend? It was so fascinating. I read Kalita Mada. Greater Tales of Hinduism. Greater Tales of Hinduism, Kalita Mada. And the dialogue between Sister Medita and you know uh, Sister Sidhvik Sudhira. I, I wrote an article, Three Women and Four Destinies, which was published in the Ramakrishna Mission Journal. Three women and four destinies. What are the three women? We haven't read those extraordinary women. One was, of course, the concept of Swami Ramakrishna Paramahansa, Sardamani. The second was, of course, Medita. The third was Sister Sudhira, and the fourth was the companion of Shior Pinto, Brunali. And Brunali happens to be the name of the spouse of both the God as well as Shior Pinto, perhaps not accidentally. <clears throat> and Brunali was treated by Sardamoni, Sarda Devi, as Bhoma, the Trinto. Then Shior Pinto was in Ali. I wrote three women and four days. <clears throat> And then Shurabindo lay in incarceration. Chardamani gave shelter, spiritual shelter. Three women changed the destiny and fate of Mina. Great Sadika in Shilong, in present Vikara. She is deeply moved, deeply moved by this 
30 bytes. I was just feeling it. I agree that just has chronicle of the spiritual life for somebody who was married many times. We talk about you know, inspiration and you know, motivation of the young. These are the books for you. So they know who <coughs> we are. The mother, just to me. And of course, in terms of technology, and it has discovered the wisdom of our own country in an unparalleled manner, in the manner in which we are. <coughs> so they become great icons for me. And doesn't the mother say, I was born French, but I was Indian by death? So here is a good instance of French and France and India, or Bengal and non Bengal. Such things called the best way of removing narrowness and fanaticism is to read three really good books that we have. That we have forgotten the legacy. You must read them. I was so great to tell you when I read Frederick Bates, who is the Eclipses in Yemen. And we've been jumping up past this book. So we have to change. We must read more of our history. And our own students. Professor Singh, uh, Professor uh, Sachidananji, Mishraji, please have some workshops for the young students under the IC. Expose the graduate students and the younger learners in this in class 12, etc. Expose them to the best thoughts. The Sufi guide. I remember a book that I was given to me as a guide, the second year of my house, called Bells. <laughs> And in English, it is called Tales of Colombo. So, tales, tales from Arabia and Tales from Mahabharata and the others, for example. It's called Not Good. Not good. All right, there's a catch there. <laughs> so, as I was saying, yeah. So, I think I'm audible. Yes. Yeah. I'm audible. As I was saying, the great book tradition. If students were to read, for example, the great book traditions, you can quarrel about the, the list of books, but it's an unending, it's an open minded kind of a list. And to read them and to understand the value of multiculturalism and cross cultural reading is so very important. Something that Ananta was telling me about. Ananta, First of all, we don't even know anything about it. Jorvindo says education should move from near to far. First of all, so nothing can the first principle of all education is nothing can be taught. So there your ahankara goes. Ahankara for teacher, that I know the answer. And the second is very, very important to me. Education must proceed from near to far. From our province. So there is no conflict between provincialism, of course, narrow provision, provincialism, fanatical, and chauvinistic kind is wrong, but province and the nation. You understand the value of the nation if you understand the value of the province. You must read what your window wrote when he was conferred the C.R. Reddy Prize, 1948. He wrote an article praising the Andhra University and the Andhra culture, the original culture. And when did the first you know, reorganization of the Indian states take place? When you're talking about multilingualism now, 1956. Sherwinder was the first, and you can have a beautiful seminar organized by the ICPR about the genesis of the multilingualism in African country. People don't talk about his signal, signal continuation. 1948, Professor Mishra, he writes, he sends a message to Andhra University. In response to C.R. Reddy, Sir C.R. Reddy conferring the Shirobindo Prize on him, and he talks about India's great regional culture, Vijayanagar Empire, the Andhra Empire. And by paying tribute to the Andhra culture, he's paying tribute to all the regional cultures. A man who knew, did not know about Bengali language until he lands in Baroda. And he well, you know, he masters the Sanskrit language, your, your own kind of an area of expertise. 
in such a remarkable manner that an ICS officer who had ambition to translate the Ramayana Mahabharata, and I'm referring to you know, Ramesh Chandra Dutt, he comes and visits and he sees the, the, the translations that Sri Aurobindo has done in Baruda after he comes. And he looks at the translation of Sri Aurobindo of the Ramayana of Mahabharata. And he says, if I knew that those translations existed, I won't have undertaken any translation. A man who was completely denied the opportunity to learn Indian languages and including Bengali by his father, who was an anglo -Pine. So I think you know there are all these strands which are there. And I think my suggestion to all of us, and to include myself, is to always have holistic his letters his autobiographical notes, and his essays, and his articles, his poetry, his synthesis of yoga, his social and political thought, I think in a seamless and incredible manner, they are all interconnected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mohanty, for this uh, profound session. And now we will move on to have some lunch and fill our empty stomachs. So we will observe a minute of silence and then we proceed from there. So, uh, so we will again assemble here at two fifteen. So let's proceed for lunch. Thank you. Very good, very good session, sir. Very good. And we'll be chairing, no? You have not yet checked in to the hostel, right? No, no, just I have come. Uh, oh, directly to the session. Okay. okay. You must also be hungry, man. Go no, no, no. and have some food. Uh, 
हमारो ए सी आर न चलते हो तीस पे चले थे तो न चले के बराबर
So welcome back everyone to the afternoon session of uh, today's uh, session and uh, uh, we will start again by observing a minute of silence. Uh, so, for this uh, for this session, as a chairperson, we will have uh, Professor Dr. Sachitanand Mohanty ji, and I would request you to come forward and take the seat, sir. And to present the first paper, we have with us uh, Dr. Gautam Ghoshal ji. Dr. Gautam Ghoshal ji is a professor at the Department of English and other more modern European languages at Vishwa Bharti University at Shantiniketan and is deeply interested in the poetry and prose of Sri Aurobindo. I would request uh, Professor Sampadanan ji to uh, honor our guest by presenting him, uh, presenting him the token of honor. Thank 
So for his uh, he will be presenting a paper titled Style and Vision in the Life Divine Tradition and Innovation. So I would request Gautam Ghoshaji to come on the stage. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. In many seminars, post lunch sessions are also time for siesta. Either people go to sleep or they are falling asleep in the audience. I do hope that this is going to be a different kind of seminar because I will request all of us to be alert, mentally alert, and to be very happy to have with us. Uh, Professor Gautam Gosha. The only correction I will make is that is the understand the new number part of Kisho Bharati is Kisho Kisho Bangla University nearby. Yes, sir. Yes, and uh, he's also a member of the group. He's sixteen. He was in college. But one thing that I want to tell about him, and this is related to the topic. <coughs> Title of the paper that he has chosen for himself. Uh, Professor Gautam Gosha is known in the short for Mindonian circles. And his work has been on Shurabindo, uh, Sandino, Shakespeare, and in the language also, language and diction and style of Shurabindo, English in particular. So, in that capacity, he, he shares kind of parallels with uh, with uh, Shodan. Uh, in origin, mm -hmm. yes, and origin in Shodhana from the poetry, poetic diction of Shodhana in size. So, language and style and substance, right? they are the things that he has really worked And uh, we are not in the field of literature. I mean, we think that style is something simple imposed on substance, but Literary critics and readers will know that style and substance go hand in hand. Sometimes the style is dictated by the substance also, as in the case of short. So it's a different angle that we have an identity that we should encounter. So that constitutes the USP, the uniqueness of the singularity of personality. So Professor Gutunji open the and yes. Thank you very much for uh, kind words. And I'd uh, like to thank Uncle uh, Sir for inviting me to speak to the audience institution. And I'm very happy my very old friend, Professor Mwandi, Marcus, my, my uh, talk will be brief, but I will definitely spread over the place. So, if we can stay. Now, before Sir Vino was writing the lecture, we have to know that there is a lot of difference between the language of Aurobindo Ghosh's There was such a vast difference between the stylistics and also in the tone. The servant, of course, attributes it to his yoga. <coughs> But there is a silence between 1910 and 1940. Except perhaps for the fact that in the record of yoga, we have a kind of rules which forms as a link between Kulva and Kulva. Yeah. 
on the theory of sexuality came out in 1945. Freud sees libido as a negative thing. Then Freud's friend Jung uh, Freud's friend Jung he uh, broke away from uh, Freud and in 1912 he came out with Book called Transformation of the Life that came out in 1912. And Jung sees the divide as a creative force. Like his Yorbindo sees the vital as a creative force. That is the link between Yorbindo's theory of the vital, Freud and Jung's theories. And also Freud couldn't place uh, the exact location of the divine, which you have to trust. As Sathrim has explained in the adventure of consciousness, it is a region located between the heart and the sex. It is neither in the sex center nor, nor in the emotion, in between. So that gives a map of the human brain. That way, it, it is a revolutionary statement in psychology. And uh, says in his letter that it was there, as Dr. Kundan uh, has already mentioned, that it was there, but it is forgotten. It was there in, in the past. These claims were in the past, but they are forgotten. Um, uh, you have named the planes. Yorbindo has uh, also named them in English. Point is, there was a sudden leap in his life, and one wonders who was his. Was in between uh, 1914 and 1921, Mr. Kunzo was in the test. You should get a life line, this is on the inside. It's two pace. It's uh, not easy to penetrate into two states. Come straight to the my paper where I have uh, now I can I am audible. So uh, the text is in its revised form, the compact structure, starting with the earliest aspirations of humans down to the future, to the present wrigglings in death, desire, and incapacity of man. To errors, faults, stagnation, backward push, and then again a renewed walk ahead as nature decides a lot about the complex journey of human beings in integral harmony on earth. Issue which Sir also explains 
the ideal of human being. I quote from the ideal of human being, for nature is slow and patient in her methods. She takes up ideas and half carries them out, then drops them by the wayside to resume them in some future era, a better combination. She tames humanity, her thinking instrument, and tests how far, how far it is ready for the harmony, as imagined. She allows and incites man to the attempt and fail, so that he may learn and succeed better than other time. This point, which we summarily told later in the ideal of human unity, had been explained in detail in the life divine. Again and again, through the structures, though the structures are more complex, not because of the language of the book, but because of the inspired thesis regarding the presence of evolution and the role of nature in the world. Rabindo is not repeating those ideas. Uh, there are plenty of, as uh, Jivai has referred to the scriptures quoted at the beginning of every chapter. And one, uh, one may be tempted to think that Sri Rabindo is repeating those things. No. He has, he is indicating his tradition and then he is going away, expanding them in the new light, in the new evolving light. So, uh, Sri Aurobindo is not repeating those ideas, but adding something new to them in every chapter. But then the Western influences are also too subtle. Sri Aurobindo himself takes up Heraclitus for detailed study. In chapter 4 of his treatise of Heraclitus, he remembers Heraclitus, Heraclitus's words. The road up and down is one and the same. It's a reference to evolution and evolution. Rabindu might have been carrying the memory of Plato's real idea when he takes up the discussion on the Sukhumai. And it is referred to by Achmeyer in his book. Uh, on, on the serving those uh, Western influences. Achmer also brings in Protinus, Schelling, Hegel, Nietzsche, Bergson, Elhard, Ebser, and Bach. However, these are all philosophers. Sirobindo is also a prose artist, superior status. We tend to forget that he is a man of literature. And he Repeatedly disclaims the title philosophy. Again and again, he says, I'm primarily a poet and a poet. And the, in Bengal, they even don't care to know that the main politician The main politician So,
Politicians use like politicians. And that is all because the was very much into politics. And the kind of involvement was different when it was compared to the mainstream politicians who are like party from the local men influencing the politics in the world. And this is difficult to Now, statistically, of all these philosophers, there are teachers who have always influenced on this type of politics. And of all the orators, literary writers, hello, of all the hello, of all the writers, uh, 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 of all the orators and literary writers, Isocrates and Cicero, along with Matthew Arnold, among the immediate predecessors, seem to have influenced his structure and suspended syntax. We'll explain that. Gilbert Hyatt, in his book, The Classical Traditions, traces on the reinterpretation of the myths in modern literature. Unfortunately, he was unaware of Cicero in those like he died. Which consistently transforms myths into metaphors. At the very outset of the book, Gurbinder examines the role of nature in human evolution. We cannot be satisfied with an imperfect sample, and yet, as we have noted, nature has sustained its work from time to time to take it up at a later phase of evolution. Author compares animal to be a living laboratory changing them into man with the intervention of nature. Starts with the passage starts with as no, I don't put the entire passage. The animal is a living laboratory in which nature has, as it is said, worked out man. I will read it out the whole passage. You know this. The texture of this prose is both logical and visionary. It's a prose of experience, which is to be seen throughout the life of man. Now, uh, experience is the basis of all his good works. Uh, Setna told me that some, some supreme kind, supreme art type of intellect is always at play. That was what Setna told me many years back. Uh, the poetic metaphor in the life divine is so terse and economical that it is often it often escapes the eye of the readers. Not like Shavitri that you get the metaphors very easily. You have to be very careful in a given situation. Mustafa Miles once said that in a given situation, a house on the hill may be an image. So Sirabindra is very terse. Uh, his prose serves and images function quite often in the right line. And the writer does not offer any metaphor which will distract our attention from the basic argument of the passage. 
<clears throat> rather than exact what laboratory comes to him as an aid to explaining the evolving man's position in the universe and the role of nature in his margins to life is progressing manifestation. The connection between matter and spirit Connection between matter and spirit is subconscious and superconscious. The role of intuition to know the truth has been known in the early Vedic period. Later on came the monk cult with Buddhism and the rational thinkers. As Sri Aurobindo is reviving a lost culture in the light divine, but along with it, he is expanding the boundaries of knowledge with the evolutionary principles of the earth. Moreover, Although the planes and the parts of the human being have been known to the old seers, according to his throwing fresh light on them with specific names for them in English. Like uh, like it being is Purushwantara in, in the in the Upanishads. Uh, is uh, it, is, it is the soul that he was from birth to birth. Not the soul, it is part of the soul that you also work with. And uh, this, is, this is forgotten even in India, in the sense. Uh, uh, which he knew was becoming a global language. He was inventing those terms, because English was becoming a global language. And even Randolph Work has accepted Sri Aurobindo's English as standard. <laughs> However, his prose style, his tone, and his expository technique in general, reminiscent of the Victorian period style, like that of the historian James Anthony Froude. Urbindo might have read Froude while preparing for his ICS examination. By and large, this is the usual prose style of the Victorian era in the late Victorian period. Like outer rights like this. We find some similarities. They are complex and they are put in your natural state to be consistent beings, and the opinion of, of this hour may not be the opinion of the next, may be different before the temptations appear, it may return to be different after the temptation is passed. This is the typical Victorian period style. Everybody was in this time. Sir Bindo was between two ages. He wrote the letters, it was quite modern, updated. But when he wrote the prose between 1914 and 1921, the Victorian period style was very much in his mind, in his consciousness. Although he was never imitating it, mostly. <clears throat> then <clears throat> he was the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. That is, because uh, Rabindu uses two kinds of style. One is Sutra uh, uh, in Sanskrit, Aphoristic, and Tika, as it is called expository. He, he, uh, he is the only writer, perhaps in India, in English, who can weave the expository and the Aphoristic with great ease. Nobody could do that so well because all the Victorian writers were like masters of expository. But the weaving of the expository and their voice, weaving of the Tita and the Sutra, that, that's where he was a master even from the Baroda You can see it in his writings on the Mahavar. Sometimes between two expository passages, one sudden line comes like and, and sandwiched by the two expositories. Passages. Two expository passages, in between there is a sutra, an aphorism. So it is very interesting. This weaving is not there. Eva Sanger uh, thought that Charles Lamb could be one influence, but uh, he even admits that no, Lamb was uh, not a master of this thing. Then the creation of a new language. Creation of a new language meant 
mapping of the human consciousness with new words, new biologies, new metaphors in the heat of inspiration, which came to him through yoga. Now, <clears throat> untransformed vital walks our sight of two secret self things. The reality of the world is that the individual cannot find his real soul. We come to the theme and there we see the departure from Freud and uh, an extension of Jung's theory of vital as a creative force because the vital can be destructive and it can be also very creative. It has two sides. And uh, even when Freud reminds PSS the period of sexuality in 1922, even when he reminds, he was insistent, no, vital is only a negative. Has nothing to do with creation. Then uh, I have cut out many parts. A TLS reviewer, reviewer found no music in the live demand. Times Literary Supplement reviewed the live demand and they found no music. And the Jubai has uh, told us that we can't. So, uh, life divine is not <coughs> all peace, always. It's often incantation and uh, the rhythm, those rhythms sometimes come very close to the So, <coughs> there's a different kind of incantation in which appears here and there, these majestic architecture, and one must have eyes to see them. Uh, years to listen to them. It is true that the music that we see in essays on the Gita is not very good. But as Yorkunda focuses on explaining, the personality of man, and especially the psychic thing, he seems to be communicating emotion through his psychic. A beautiful passage. One psychological passage is quoted by others. Or quoted still, but it's a matter of first use. I intended to quote it because it is very vital. It speaks of the psychic thing and the inmost subliminal. It is the inmost subliminal thing. The true soul secret in us, subliminal, we have said. The word is misleading. The presence is not situated below the threshold of the human mind, but rather burns in the temple of the inmost part, behind the thick screen of the foreign mind, life and body, not subliminal, but behind the veil. This veiled psychic entity is the flame of the Godhead, always alive within us, inextinguishable even by the pain some. Then, See how in how many ways he is using metaphors for the psychic thing. It is the flame born out of the divine and luminous inhabitant of the ignorance, grows in it till it is able to turn it towards the knowledge. He is using uh, metaphors for the psychic thing. Yeah. As metaphors. Because he is also referring to the demon of Socrates. It is the concealed witness and control, the hidden light, the demon of Socrates, the inner light, inner voice of the mystic, it is that which endures and is imperishable in us from birth to birth, and thus by death, decay or corruption, the industrial, industrial uh, spark of the divine. That is the divine nucleus in us. It cannot be destroyed. And see how he has used images, exact images. Uh, think about it. So, uh, the passage is densely metaphorical, words and phrases like one, one point uh, clarified here. Norbindo contradicts with the Western psychologists on the issue of the subliminal. 
because the word subliminal has been in use since the 1860s Europe. <clears throat> so in Europe, subliminal and the subconscious are equal. Sriabindo says that the subconscious is below and the subliminal is behind. So all these inner mind, inner vital, inner physical, and the ego psyche, they are subliminal. So he connects Western psychology to deconstructs and deconstructs that you think about human, the map of human consciousness. So uh, the passage is basically metaphorical words and phrases like the presence of pain, imperishable, burns in the city, things to gain, luminous in every death, living life, the other subject of it. These are so bare that you might, uh, you might just overlook them as poetry. They are metaphors. Yamana subject is then <coughs> spark of the divine. So modern poetry is brief but suggestive in the use of metaphors. Sriyavinta has written uh, in both styles. He has been very superfluous sometimes and also sometimes very complex. There are many other instances in the life you mind when there is there is an unnoticed effect of modern poetry. This poetry does not distract us from super, super scientific inquiry into the inside of human beings. Uh, there are two passages which I have put, I will put one passage for queries. So this, this is about the secret claim, the inmost subliminal of which Srodhindu is speaking here, in clarifying in the life divine, and he is so inspired. Language has taken a leap. There are two things about Srivindu's language. One is very clear, you are moving smoothly, smoothly, then suddenly he takes a leap. Even in a book on uh, poetic reading, which is poetry, he does it. There is a sudden leap he takes, and you are you have to be within the vibration of Srivindu. Otherwise, he gets it. It is. As Jyotu Mahapatra has said, poetry is language plus. Many years back, he wrote to me in a letter, poetry is language plus. So, like that, that last element in Suryavindu has had to be taught by your consciousness. That cannot be done by anybody. That long habit of reading Suryavindu yes. because he does take a certain leap some. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> the kind of vibration with which you have to enter before you really come to it. You have to enter into the atmosphere, the words of the That is uh, the problem. This is a beautiful passage explaining this idea. Trying to, trying to pull the rhythm. It's like something like the, the, uh, the water is, the picture is in the making. The water is slowly building the picture. It's coming like this, 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 taking its place. And as if the picture is being built in the wheel, slowly the structure is wonderful. Best passages of the cycle. Guidance, guidance, governance begins from within. Guidance, guidance, comma, governance begins from within. Guru holo cycle kept me here. Cycle starts coming out. Guidance, governance begins from within, which exposes every movement to the light of. Repels what is false, obscure, opposed to the divine reality. The 
in the end is the full of it. Every region of the being, every nook and corner of it, every movement, formation, direction, inclination of thought, will, emotion, sensation, action, reaction, motive, disposition, propensity, desire, habit of the conscious, of the subconscious physical, in the most unseen, amorphous, mute, recondite, lighted up, the unerring sight. Let's take it. <clears throat> One reads in the proper way, it is breathtaking. Their confusions dissipated, angles disentangled, the single self. Their obscurities, deceptions, self deceptions precisely indicated and removed. Then he comes to the final conclusive part of the message. All is purified, set right, whole nature harmonized. Modulated in the psyche, put in spiritual That's the answer. It's wonderful. Just like the teacher gave the meeting and So my, my comments on the passage. <clears throat> the author here describes the movement of the emerging psyche, which aims to enlighten all the dark areas of the Anaphoral stress on the word every is followed by a series of single word, closed up by the single word, closed up by commas to highlight the power of the transfiguring light, which is an honoring psychic light. At so the end of the procession of single word parallelism, there begins another anaphora of air. Anaphora is the repetition of the same word, the same cause at the beginning. After the end of the procession of single word parallelism, there begins another anaphora of there. And finally, after the last punctuation mark, we are told about the total work of psychic transformation. All is beautiful. This is the final work of psychic transformation, culminating in put in spiritual order. Such a grand vision as the divine life on earth would not have been expressed without this grand style. <clears throat> As in essence on the Gita, here also, though in a limited way, poetic rhythm comes in aid of experiences. Even after that, there will come a stage of stagnancy in the supermind peace and finishes of the work of triple transformation. As compared to the syntax of Aces of the Gita, the author of the Light Divine has little scope for the pure Ciceronian structure of the suspended syntax. The suspended syntax, the predicate has to wait long. Man who came to my office in the morning, my room in the morning, with a cup of tea. Wearing a hat, wearing a black shirt, with a pair of sunglasses, with a jacket. The ticket is still not there. He is going to. So you have to wait long for. This is what suspected syntax has been discussed. <coughs> this is the typical Cicerodian style. There's a good book, classical writers of English prose by J. A. K. Thompson. He has examined all of these styles in the compressed Seneca of the Gita. As compared to the syntax of Isidro the Gita, the author of the Light Divine has little scope for the pure Cicerone structure of the suspended syntax. And yet, it, it is such an intrinsic part of your Hindu's school style that you cannot avoid it all. In the Light Divine, too, we have this. I've given an example and I've compared it as wonder. This 
Like uh, once again, I give another example. <clears throat> man who was knocking at my door in the morning and was delayed to open the door because I was in the toilet, because I was having my bath. And I, I, had to I, 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 I spent a lot of time in the toilet. It was a friend of my so This was is the predicate. And it's your window, even in future poetry, the target comes at the end of the page sometimes. That, why is it I think this proves? Because he is a modern. He's writing in 1920, he's using the Cesaronian structure, which is already obsolete. And maybe because as an artist, he felt it suitable to express those ideas. Sometimes he was compelled to express those ideas in those structures because common simple sentences are not enough to express. Because you have to remember that your people write English like Sanskrit. Then you come to oneself. Durbin the rights, English like the Sanskrit, same density in the position and also the same language. So he was creating a language. Who knows? Future won't take it back again as a model. It's simple, the simple and the intricate and the order, making it Nehru was always a little side, a modest side of the city side, like Gandhi. Nehru was sometimes using complicated structures. So, this is uh, about the style of the theme of the type divine, which is uh, already spoken of the theme in very, a very brief way. The text in its revised form is a compact structure starting with the earliest aspirations of humans down to the future, through the present wrigglings in death, desire, and incapacity, man through errors, or stagnation, backward push, and then again a new walk ahead, and nature decides a lot about this complex journey of human beings in integral harmony on earth. This is the theme. Not always you can write great spiritual adventures, or because he was an artist, he thought it best record it in terms of art, adventure of the greatest adventure of human consciousness. Thank you, Professor Gosa, for putting that to us. And a very interesting treatment of sure in those style, in those style like we have. I'll just make a few preparatory remarks before we open it up for question answers and the process. Why is that? I think it will be appropriate to know that. No less a person than Ida Saxe had nominated the life divine for the world. It was not any other word. He would seldom think of any philosophical word being nominated for Nobel Prize in Literature. I mean, we know Churchill's, Winston Churchill's history of the World War, Second World War, nominated. And he got the Nobel Prize for Literature. Or uh, uh, 
the decline in gibbons, decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Extraordinary. I mean, sure, in the future poetry says that the language which acquires a heightened state becomes poetry. Language, any language can become, any language, any discipline can acquire a heightened state. And it <coughs> assumes the nature of poetry. That's something which is worth remembering. I think that you spoke about uh, diction and the style used in different books. And, and you also did very well to say that within a single book also there is a variation in style. I suspect that when he is really talking about things which are revelatory, which are futuristic, he increasingly assumes the poetic kind of approach because he is seeing into the future. In contrast to that, there are areas where he is analytic. Is eschewing that revelatory style for the analytic. So I think it also has to do with the purpose that he has in mind in a particular juncture. Second thing is that, of course, we know it, he wrote from above. I mean, I also made this kind of reference. The language wrote itself. Baron Gosh also talks about it. There is a kind of a stereotype which is clear. But we must also remember when you look at the facsimile of the, the pages which are available to us, including the book that I am handling directly, the first page itself has got so many changes, is making so many changes. And we know, and, and I'm sure that Gautam Dias will have things to say about that. On the years of what low powerful films, William Wordsworth said. But it is emotion recollected in tranquility. And if you look at the type scripts of what's what's, you know, solitary poet or, uh, you know, I wonder lonely as a cloud, for example, or go to the West Wing or of, of Shelley or anything. If you see in the humanities research center, I had the privilege to go and see how many changes have been made there. And we think that it's all automatic, it is coming in a sense of inevitability, and there is no change required. And I'm sure Gautamda, you would also say, how many times you're going to change the first opening kind of Savitri? Until he settled for it, it was the hour before God said So this notion that, you know, I'm an inspired genius and I write, and if I write something, it will never be changed. That is not correct. That is not really testified in the, in the works of the greatest time. You know, what's worse for the prelude 1898 and prelude if, uh, 1798 and 1815, for example. There are new changes there. Yeah, because uh, the Buddha often says that even the revision comes to an English. I want to, I have a, a slightly different take about uh, so creating a new style. I think we have to also see historicized short in the style and short in the style. One of the things that has to be seen in an objective manner, I could be wrong, is that after a certain while, after 2014 or so, he was not in touch with the academic culture of his times or the world. He used to read what was given to him. He never made an effort, for example. He didn't have much of an interest because he was trying to do several things at the same time. Yoga writing letters to the devotees. And that she has given a priority. How many people, I mean, I have not seen instances of any guru who eschews, for example, his primary writings to write letters to devotees like disciples like Vili Kumar. Extraordinary. I think I'm sure you'll have at least two minutes to say in the course of your response to the, the language that he writes in the letters. Please. His letters are a far apart. And you can see the, I mean, the, I mean, our letters are very perfunctory. I don't think we just use a very careful language when you are writing a letter. Should have been just letters and literature. Letters to Dil Kumar Roy and others and Setna. Literature to Niruta was full of humor. And letter to Fritz Nolinita when he wants to go and get married. 
and the way you know he's sort of puncturing the desire of Nodinita to go and get married, want to satisfy your carnal desire, and which men call marriage. Look at that, hardity. Absolutely. So I think different styles, but one must have to admit that he, he read what was given to him. He was not in the cross, he was not in touch with the latest thought for him. And yet, Lawrence also, somebody gave him. Stephen Spender also, somebody. So I think it was a loss that uh, because of circumstances that prevailed in Panchiri. He did not have access to the recent writings of the kind that all of us. And we also invite the charge that will be outdated increasingly. So the uh, late Victorian and the early Edwardian yeah, style that you're talking about, I think he was a product of that kind of culture. And in a great measure, he continued that because when practically speaking, he was not in the first time. So these are the remarks that I have to make. But I'm sure he will have things to say. And Gautam there also will respond. And even if he not responds, at least based on some of the things that I have said, you can just uh, you know, express you to your views. And anybody from that. Yes, on his latest professor, Gokak has said, these are the most revealing body of latest suffrage work cases. And perhaps more important for the future of criticism. Yes. Anybody? Please, I mean, I will uh, just encourage you to speak and then go to the table and take all the questions. Yes, please. Your name and your question. Yes. Professor, Dr. K. Vengadachal, Vice President of the First Christian Body, Chandra in Tamil Nadu. So I will need a full time question. It just broke down. No, it's okay. I'm fine. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for sharing the industries. I also hear analyzing the language of the The first issue is uh, I think there is a levels of mind disease in the pollution or pollution of the human kind in future. The future poetry and the aims of Language is somewhere between mental world, where the language has been different syntax, direction, connotation, and denotation. Very important to the mental level. So, in the hierarchy of mind, whether the argument is explaining uh, any moderation or any changes in the language as well as equivalent to the hierarchy of mind? Yes, that's the first one. Shall I go? Yes, please, second one also. And secondly, to make it a for a normal contemporary uh, research students. Uh, basically, uh, a poetic idea in the poetic form uh, will always have an uh, indifferent interpretation uh, in compared to the comprehensive. So, uh, Rishi or uh, I mean, person like Shyamalindo and this supramental ideology in the poetic form. For the present researcher is going to understand in the absence of the authority so how, how these challenges can be faced by the present researchers if they undergo research. Thank you. You see, the, the window has uh, the future poetry. Is the future poetry is not Sir Window's uh, final thing you push because it was followed by letters to Lady Satan. Taken together, you have the whole. Uh, body of the studies. Now we are trying to frame total body of criticism of Sir Rindo, and uh, that will explain the point of hierarchy in poetry. And about uh, reading Sir Rindo C, that is, Sir uh, Rindo did not write from the supermind. So the supermind is not expressed here. He wrote from the overmind. And from the other planes, other spiritual planes, like the human mind, the whole mind, uh, the intuition. And this intuition is not mental intuition, this is spiritual intuition. So now the mind can guess higher levels 
form, which is mind can guess and have your perception, even though he is not clear. Put a line from Sri Aurobindo's uh, first canto of Sri Aurobindo's Shalati. The blank presumes that yearns towards the distant change. Blank foreknowledge that yearns towards the change. So we have a perception of that. And uh, Sri Aurobindo has tried his best to communicate these things. And uh, although in the sonnets, that is a problem of objective coordinate as he said here, as said in Hamlet and his problems, that there is a problem of objective coordinate in Shakespeare. Also in serving the sonnet, question may be asked, is there any objective coordinate? Now this is a research which has been going on, is going on still. But still uh, poet, no poet, no great poet is uh, giving out everything one reading. You take it for years, 20 years later, you take it up again and then you read it. So the process of learning certain things inside, it goes and on and on. Poetry is a different thing. For prose, uh, it is different. There's nobody, I, can I say something? Oh. <clears throat> See, for uh, sure, window, the desire to uh, inness to express the inexpressible. I have tried to understand. How do you, with the help of the mind, give a glimpse of something which is beyond? I tried my best and I thought of, I have looked at the last writings of Shurabindu. The last writings of Shurabindu were written at the suggestion of the mother, which appeared in the bulletin of the Shurabindu. They were really meant for his graduation. <coughs> they appeared interestingly under the title, Supramental Manifestation of God. Have you read? Anybody read Supramental? Mr. Sampadhananji, have you read Supramental Manifestation or no? Yes. Something very, very curious I experienced. What I experienced was that I thought I should find out what the nature of the supermind is. But I could not really find the life divine. I mean, Suggestions, illuminations, revelations. But what, as Sri Aurobindo would say, what is the blessed nature of Supermind? And I was looking at the language, five chapters I did, five chapters. And in one line, you think that he's going to tell you the truth in the next line. Next line also, you don't get. <laughs> next line, you don't get. Second paragraph, you think you're going to get. I think this is a series of postponement. Postponement of what is the superman? Yes, something which is which cannot which is not heard now you will be heard. Something which is not conventionally understood you will also be. But positively, what is it? In synthesis of yoga, also the same thing I found. Then it comes to clairvoyance, when we belongs to telekinesis, for example. Things with many of these people are making experiments. But what is it actually? I think it just eludes, eludes human comprehension. What do you think, Gautam? There, there is a perception with which you have to catch something of the vibration, as Gautam said. You have to enter into the vibration, the words of the end. And that way you can go uh, into the deeper provinces. With the intellect, no one help. You want to point it with not? Next case, how about academic? Just coming in two minutes. In that case, how about academic? 
I can be research about that. I have read. No, I mean, as a way of comparison, I would say, for example, if you have done some academic research on Blake, on Malarme, French symbolist poetry, you have to, you know, belong to a different kind of genre of criticism in order to be in sympathy with that kind of poetry. You can't be just some generalist and say it doesn't make sense to you. You have to be well versed. If you read Katie Sitnam, for example, is written about Blake, Blake's tiger. And the range of references that Blake has here, Katie has, Katie Sitnam has given. I mean, it's not like reading Times of India, no? That, uh, you know, you read one page, you don't understand, you throw it. It should not happen like that. Any discipline worth the salt it requires a certain kind of a style from your, for yourself. I mean, I was reading the, like, the ideal of your I mean, he's talking like a, writing like a political philosopher. He's not using that divine style. Political philosopher. When he's talking about continental agglomeration, when he's talking about the Cold War, for example, when he's talking about the virtualistic experiment, he's using the vocabulary of the, he's using the political experiment. <laughs> We have to see what book is he writing for which audience. And the amazing thing that I found for you to know, she was writing four or five books at the same time. And each book having your style. The style in ideal of human or your human psyche is very different from life divine. Between 1914 to 1990, that is the time that you wrote all this. You know, Secret of the Vedas also, he wrote. I think it's an amazing kind of the mind. The way the mind is able to really generalize its interest depending on the objective that she has. Thank you. Can we go to the second paper? Nilabji? So thank you so much, Gautamji, for uh, uh, explaining us the styles Sri Aurobindo uses in his life divine. And moving on, we have Dr. Shivji Singh. And he is an associate professor of physics at the Government College of Education in Chandigarh. And he has uh, also been associated with Sri Aurobindo Society since 15th of August 1995. So uh, please, uh, Shivji uh, Singhji, I would like to welcome you on stage uh, for presenting your paper. Thank you. Thank you. So the title of his paper is uh, Human Aspiration and the Future of Mankind, the Unique Vision of Sri Aurobindo. With the blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo, I was able to write something. And going to the literature and the work of Sri Aurobindo is really a vast experience. And uh, I'll start from uh, the first chapter of uh, Sri Aurobindo's life designs, human aspiration. And I sort of writing on this one at the beginning of my journey in the study of Sri Aurobindo. Uh, in uh, this aspiration, although it is termed as Ahimsa and Hindi, but uh, I find a parallel between what's uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Shraddha God has been used. And it is said in the fourth chapter, Shraddha Vaan Lavte Gyanam Tattva Sanyatendriya, uh, Gyanam Lavva Param Shanti Nasiranandi Gacha. So similarly, I find that life divine, uh, many people have in many ways, but when I read uh, Life Divine, I find Life Divine as one of the most profound and practical encyclopedia of the science of holistic human transformation. And it, everything has been, uh, you know, the way it has been started with human aspiration and it is concluded with the kind of div uh, divine life on the earth is something such a scientific and step by step method of transformation of human nature. Starting from the mental to the physical, 
and you see that this transformation of physical is the most difficult. And he talks of uh, the physical culture. So, uh, to start with, Chiradindu, the Rishi of India's resurgence, has thrown a unique light on individual as a collective development and transformation of human, human beings. The animal, uh, to quote, as Gautamda uh, already said it, I'll quote, the animal uh, from the life divine, the animal is a living laboratory in which nature has, it is a worked out man. Man himself may well be a thinking and living laboratory in whom and with whom con whose conscious cooperation they will to work out the superman, the God. But the fact is that how nature will cooperate, how man will cooperate, so that the superman will come. The starting point to me, I feel that aspiration, which is one of the purest forms of energy, intending to realize the future perfection in its plenary manifestation. And that is very important. Aspiration has to be nurtured in all our aspects, all our dimensions, be it education, be it uh, management, be it uh, uh, anything whatsoever. Uh, see, Rindu has already also asked, uh, you know, talked of this in one of his uh, early writings, the mother, one of the profound writings on integral yoga. The three cardinal steps of sadhana for human transformation, I add, that are namely aspiration, rejection, and service. First, they pick aspiration. Uh, I'm quoting Shirindu. The personal effort required is a triple labor of aspiration, rejection, and surrender. And the nature of aspiration is expressing as an aspiration, vigilant, constant, unswitching, the mind's will, the heart seeking, the essence of the vital being, the will to open and make plastic the physical consciousness in nature. So, history of humanity is full of twelve tribulations for progress, where aspiration is one of the common denominators generally found in all of as the most significant factor of growth in development. Whether it is emergence of humanity from physical poverty or emergence of humanity from intellectual poverty, or even the you can say realization of the mortality, for everything aspiration has to be there. And if the aspiration is there, it's not that it will remain as it is the element of divine, but it has to be nurtured constantly. And that is one of the aspects of yoga, which we have to do in integral yoga also. Uh, I will start with the, the three aspects which Shirindo talks of. First, he says, talks of the process of evolution, where he says that life is involved in matter. That is why from matter, life is involved. Similarly, Consciousness is involved in life, that's why it is uh, evolve, evolving. And similarly, the next level is talking about super mind, super mind and superman and gnostic beings. So, at the second aspect, he's saying the whole of the world is the divine Lila, Lila of the divine, the play of the divine. So, if we love God, if we try to love God, aspire to love God, be one with God, it cannot be done without our love. Very clear statement of Sarah And it's very scientific that we cannot exclude humanity, we cannot exclude material things if you want to reach God. Because reaching God, and he talks of purity. And I'm reminded of one of the writings of Pradas, Pradas where he says that Manamera Nirmalbhaya, Jaise Ganga Neer, Pache Pache Hari Kahat Pirat Kahat Kabir Kabir. And that is also what Sarah talks about. That purity must be there. Unalloyed uh, you know, adherence to the process of purity. Without purity, the flame of aspiration cannot be born, cannot be kept constant, unceasing. Now I'll talk about this. I'll come to the next aspect that Chirivindo is uh, talking about in life divine, the dynamics of human development. Chirivindo says spiritual power in the in the present creates. Material power in the future. Material power in future, that's what the humanity, how will humanity proceed in future depends on the present state of the spirituality in the totality of mankind, in collective consciousness. It's talking of individual consciousness as well as collective consciousness. And that is why he's talking of creation of centers of collective consciousness, aiming towards purity and aspiring to 
reach God or reach the uh, divine. The man, uh, to quote Sherman again, the man who most finds and lives from the inner self can most embrace the universal and become one with it. The Swarat, the independent, self possessed and self ruler, can most be the Samrat, possessor and shaper of the world in which he lives, can most too grow one with all in the Atman. This is the truth, this truth, this developing existence teaches us, and it is one of the greatest secrets of the old Indian spiritual knowledge. Swarat and then Samrat. If you want to be Samrat, we have to be self ruled and we have to be self guided. And that self has what Vasuna has already talked about the psyche. He's talking about the psyche. And the conditions are there for the um, emergence of psyche as the individual leader and emergence of psyche and the collectivity as the collective leader towards divine protection. Now, uh, see, human development is not just a static function of time. Time, it's uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, we are thought of time independent and time dependent, dependent parameters. There is the talks of four aids in sadhana. And sadhana for what? Human transformation. This whole aspect of sadhana, as far as I have understood a little bit, is for human transformation, total human transformation. And I say that guru, sadhana, utsa, and kal. So it's time dependent. And at the same time, it's time independent in the sense automatically it cannot happen. We have to create the conditions for it in which human aspiration must be nurtured in our and it's not, I can say, it's not like rocket science, it's not very difficult. It's very simple in the sense that, uh, as uh, already Patrana has quoted, uh, that uh, we have to leave one of the, I think, most scientific statement of Sherabindo, I feel, like a student of science, that to understand Sherabindo and Sherabindo especially, we have to enter into the atmosphere of the worlds created by uh, the was Shabda Brahm Kiva. Here comes the, main, uh, the context of Shabda Brahm. And uh, while uh, suggestions, giving suggestions for the reading of Sarendra, the mother also says that how you have to read Sarendra. You, you cannot understand through intellect because you cannot be grasped through intellect. We have to have a gross Sarendra with a certain state of reverence and a certain state of faithfulness. The faith has to be there. And this faith creates the kind of atmosphere, creates the kind of uh, receptivity for understanding. And this is my personal experience also. Although I have been associated with Sri writing since 1995, uh, just after even I was in the second year of my MSc. But recently I started understanding a little bit, as far as I can say, and enjoying it. Because I had, I felt, yes, every time I refer to the words of the mother, that we want, if you want to read Sri Aurobindo, read a little bit every day. And read at a particular time. So that it creates the atmosphere and it goes into your mind and it creates the sales. That is the word which mother, the mother says. That if there are no sales in your mind to understand, the sales will be created. That is the impact of the grace. And that is what I feel that uh, uh, this thing has to be uh, attempted. And not just as uh, the Prem has very nicely given about the right, the title, the adventure of consciousness. But I think this is the adventure of aspiration. Humanity has to have the adventure of aspiration for total transformation or integral or holistic transformation. Without this, we cannot have the advantage from what Sirendo has uh, presented as a gift to humanity in his adventure of consciousness. So, Devendra explains in his on the Gita also. All the problems of human life arise from the complexity of our existence, the obscurity of its essential principle, and the secrecy of inmost power that makes out deter, uh, its determination and governs it, its, it, uh, its purposes and its processes. In the life divine asserts, all problems of existence are essentially the problems of harmony. They arise from the perception of an unsolved discord and the instinct of an, an undiscovered agreement or unity. Pure and living human aspiration creates the receptivity for higher powers to act upon life 
as well as on material world, thereby creating conditions for higher degree of harmony to prevail in a given situation. Thus, it is conducive in optimum human and material development. And then uh, I'll just quote uh, from Sanitary that uh, the Revenge has very nicely uh, given. That, uh, it says that if we uh, sometimes there is question, skepticism comes in, that if we attempt and we do not get the desired success, what Then he says that in one of the lines of the Sanitary. Earth is a heroic spirit's battlefield. Very beautiful line. And then says that uh, his failure is not failure whom God leads. Through all the slow, mysterious march goes on, an immutable power has met this mutable world. A self fulfilling transcendence frees man's road, the driver of the soul upon its path. It knows its steps, its ways inevitably. And how shall the end be been in folly? So the authentic fire to sustain the flame of progress, as Alok Pandey very nicely put in uh, his book, if we have the fire, then the techniques will come. Here now, what is happening? Uh, the entire humanity is fo focusing on techniques of the world. And hardly people are focusing on the fire. We are, uh, I think, we are putting the uh, uh, machine in the reverse gear. And that is the problem of humanity today. An uh, authentic fire to sustain the flame of progress. If we have the fire, then the techniques will come and go, grow and evolve. But if we have only a technique and not the authentic fire, then we are like cheap imitation jewelry, which invites robbers, but is unfit for the body. There is something very remarkable. Human aspiration needs to be nurtured by all possible means in order to ensure a bright future of my kind of the journey of earthly existence because earth is a heroic spirit's battlefield. And what is the heroism? The real heroism is not in fighting the Asuric forces. Although Asuric forces are there, there is the talks of Asuric forces and we have to be aware of them. But the Asuric forces are in a way test for our nurturance of the film of education. And that is why the real heroism is in sustaining the fire of aspiration and sustaining the flame of aspiration. Human aspiration needs to be nurtured as I was said. All, all our conscious efforts then must be geared to planting the seed of aspiration in individuals and groups and nurturing that seed for effective manifestation in all its use for an early possible actualization of life divine okay. It is pertinent here to end the topic with the quotation from Sherwindo from the life divine self, the eternal paradox, an eternal truth of divine life in an animal body, an immortal aspiration or reality inhabiting a mortal tenement, a single and universal consciousness representing itself in limited mind and divided egos, a transcendent indefinable, timeless, and spaceless being who it alone renders time and space and cosmos possible, and in all these, the higher truths realizable by the lower term, justify themselves to the deliberate reason as well as to persistent instinct of intuition. I am reminded here of the theory of relativity and the, the quantum uh, physics of uh, creation and annihilation of matter from energy. There is in mathematics, we have creation and analytic parameters through which we create, we virtually create things, and you say matter is creation of energy. That's what Sarah also talks of. So science and spirituality both are coming together at one point. But we are deliberately not creating conditions for collaboration. Because one thing is being seen at one end, one extreme, the other is at other extreme, and unless both come together. The reality of the reality, reality of the unreality, and the reality of the Maya cannot be understood in its integral vision. And without this integral vision, the total transformation or integral transformation of human being will always remain a dream. Despite the fact 
fact that the Rangarani mother had given us on platter the formula of the uh, And actually, very much thankful to the university, the student university, the entire team of wonderful Rishis and Rishis in the making for giving me an opportunity to listen to such wonderful talks and share my So we had uh, not a philosopher but a scientist talking to us about the importance of aspiration and uh, this beautifully linked up aspiration to transformation. Generally, we think that aspiration is something given to us, and why is there any need to talk about aspiration? But as the mother said, the nature of our dream lies the quality of our. And by aspiration, she meant the dream that she had. I have a dream. And many movements are created because of great dreams. Martin Luther King also said about that. So, aspiration and the nature of quality of aspiration is so integral to what you have in your mind. And what you have in mind is transformation. And the last quotation that you gave is so eloquent. In substance, little and you know, mortal body, not with a finite mind, with an infinite mind, and the transformation of the body. And I was thinking that all of us have a desire to perpetuate our life, to have another life, and the memories of the past life. And as the mother once said, how painful it is to really live. To remember all the memories for one life. Imagine next life being born and all the residue of the memories of the previous life. All the dreams and the failures and the frustrations that we have gone through. I think death is a welcome thing. To forget about this experience and to take up a new world. To take up new life and experience. I think death from that point of view is not cessation of life. But I think from Shurbindo's point of view, it's a necessary prerequisite for taking up a new birth and to keep a direction, new direction to our own kind of birth, the journey of this. And if you do that, because one of the greatest fears that all of us have is the fear of death. You read the lines of Tekor, which my, mother, my father had repeated. What a wonderful life it is. How painful it is to really give up life. So when you reach your window and the life divine, we also understand the, the meaning of death. Death in the forest. Sanity. Beautiful death. Death in the forest. And no answer to that. Why certainly this kind of thing is happening? So aspiration and transformation and mediated by cessation of life and death. Those are very, very important points. And I want to thank you. You were so well read, and you spoke so knowledgeably about your people, despite being a scientist and a physicist. We need more physicists to talk to us about your people's theory of We now have the pleasure, please take your place. We now have the pleasure to have the last talk of this today. Afternoon, and you can see there is a flame. I mean, I have not seen any seminar of flame burning for example. Beautiful. You must really compliment all of you, Mr. Dhananji, for creating this beautiful atmosphere with the flame light lit there. And all of us, the fellow seekers on the way. So, the last yeah. talk of this afternoon, who is the last speaker? Uh, he is uh, Abhishek Tripathi ji. Okay. Online? Okay. No, no. He is here. I am just uh, presenting his paper. Uh, present his paper? No, no. I will not. Just on the screen. He is giving an online? Yeah. He is here? He is here. Yeah. Okay. Please come. A few words about him. So, 
Thank you, Shilji. And uh, now we have uh, Abhishek Tripathi ji, who is a doctoral uh, student at the Psychology and Cognitive Science Department at uh, Spenza University of Rome. He has completed his MA in Psychology from Nalanda University in Rajgir, and uh, his research uh, explores the understanding of Hatha Yoga, Vipassana, meditation, and psycho-philosophical study of mindfulness. Abhishek ji also has a research interest in knowledge diplomacy and research collaboration in higher education. And his uh, the title of his paper is Sri Aurobindo Less Known uh, Involution Evolution of Self in Tantric Siddhi Prakarana. So welcome Abhishek ji, please present your paper. Genesis, and when I was searching for the literature, I could find some of Aurobindo's words. I could find some critical elements of what he said when somebody, I think, some of his disciples or somebody asked him, records of yoga? Is it written? Records of yoga? <laughs> so I think uh, a disciple uh, asked Aurobindo sometime and said that uh, he wanted to write something on his biography. And and this is what he replied that no one can write my life because it has not been on the surface for me to see. So, I mean, you, you can always find these interactions with his letters, these, you know, mystical, these unknown things somewhere underlying when he's writing and communicating with disciples or people, both when he was very politically active and later on when he was not very politically active and moved to Odisha. So, I mean, uh, just to introduce uh, uh, Tantra, I mean, I know a lot of audience here is pretty known to this discipline, but uh, those who know it also, I mean, out of so many disciplines and out of so many uh, philosophical traditions India has, Tantra probably has the most pluralistic, 
you can find array of you know disciplines within the tantric discipline. Uh, it has found mentioned in Vedas, in Puranas, and especially in Veda, the other Veda supposed to be considered as the Veda for tantric literature. And Tantra also finds uh, a lot of its so mentioned in Ayurveda, Jyoti Shastra, and uh, something like this in uh, Mahabharata, where he said, Yatha Pravartate Tantram Yatha Cha Pratishyati. See, the, as simple as the order of the body, you know, also has been down to define Tantra. Then in, in Shaivite and, uh, and Tantric uh, practices, the literature of these people has also termed as that, which is considered Agamas for them. Like uh, uh, Vedas for the uh, Vedic literature and the Agamas for the Tantric uh, history. In Atha Veda, there is a very great reference, and this could be a genesis here. You could see how uh, the emergence of Om happens uh, in Yoga Brahman, where uh, uh, the Prajapati or the Brahman has created this world and everything. And, and he says that I'm looking for something which unifies everything. And then, then emerges the word O, which is of the first syllable, and create waters and moisture and second. And thereafter, the Srishti begins. So you could see even the genesis of some of these tantric uh, things, even in Athar especially in Gopatra. So, with this background, if you look at Tantric City program, uh, we could say that it's a treatise on Tantric perfection. Uh, when we read the Aurobindo and we find that he always talks about this life divine and all, the underlying current is that, that he wants this human to you know, reach to his own potential or the fullest potential. <laughs> so, that's why he says that. Uh, he relates, I think, this tantric practice, these old rituals and ancient Indian tantric practices to very much to human perfection. And while defining this human perfection, he says like a systematic process of self-enhancement self toward transformative goals <coughs> of merging the boundaries, non-separation of matter and spirit to realize the integration of fullness of being. And we can find all across in literature this integration of being and becoming an evolution. And that is what he relates when he talks about the But one very interesting thing, maybe it's, it's his own experience and when he has lived through these phases of his life, but he still says that it's a remarkable yogic system which in its nature is synthetic and starts from a great central principle of nature, but he distinguishes it from yoga. That's very sure. And that goes. But obviously, these Agumas and Shavites and you know Shakta, they also have been saying it that it is different. It's not as the integral yoga uh, or in general within the Indian tradition. So he also accepts that. And then he says that this integral system could be termed as the day of the world. So what he talks about is uh, one, one very important thing is that it seems while reading this text that uh, this particular text has been left in the way for some reason or the other. Because he says that I am talking about this first chapter and he <laughs> wanted to write and you know great people tends to write so many things at same places and also this this text looks incomplete. Maybe you would have written more uh, more chapters about it. It has around 35 total verses uh, on, on Tantra. But very at the very beginning he said that uh, in the, this process of human uh, achieving this human perfection, uh, he talks about two forms of worship to Goddess Kali. So he, in his this uh, text, he talks about uh, the, uh, the Shakti as, as Kami. So he says either you, a sadhaka or the yogi, can identify that he or here is the I is the notion for the sadhaka when he or she believes that I am she. So this identification with Kali goes in and or he can he also refers that there is another form of worshipping goddess Kali uh, for the human perfection is that he, uh, he, he took the uh, Sankhya position where he says that the Sadhaka is the Pusha and, and the uh, Kali here is a Prakriti. 
where the sadhaka becomes the instrument later on for the perfection. So, but one thing is common, and in, in the later verses he says that, as you could see in the uh, in the verse five, he says that the principal means for both of these forms of worship is self surrender. So, whether this could be two forms of uh, this to goddess Kali, but the uh, underlying principle remains the same that is to surrender to the goddess Kali. And uh, self surrender has given, he has given a lot of importance to self surrender, and he says that where will be Sadhana Abhu And then in, in subsequent verses, he also talks about that who can do it. So he says the sadhaka who is like who has gone beyond vices and virtues and bad and I mean he's not confined to what is good and what is bad and not confined to categorization of vice and virtue. He he is or she is ready for uh, practicing this sadhana. When we read these texts, you find that uh, there is an element of bhakti, then there is also the influence of shakta tantra. And the manifestation of personal worship to Goddess Kali. So you could read the amalgamation of these three into uh, those uh, tantric practice. Then he says, you have a right to that, that level, then what you should do. So here again he goes back to Sankhya where he takes these uh, uh, tamsik, rajasik, and uh, sattvic egos, which uh, Sadhaka has to done away with. So he said, with the help of yoga. So he talks about both. For, for some people, this could be very natural. They can be in a position where they can initiate themselves. And others can take the help of yoga to remove these three. So even he uh, says that the sattvic ego, because the, the ego of the knowledge or the ego of the piety also has to done away with. So all these three egos has to be uh, done away before you get initiated into the so in the uh, from verse 9 to 13 he talks about uh, one very uh, interesting thing in this text also i mean he uh, has this uh, parallel with vedanta chatushtaya where he talks about few quartets like four four, four goals uh, for each those quartets one has to perform so this uh, seven quartets we find in his uh, larger literature. But when it comes to ta uh, Tantric Siddhi program, mainly if you could see from like perfection of power, perfection of knowledge, perfection of body, and eventually this perfection of peace. So that's what he talks about in uh, verse 29. Systematic and progressive path of preparation, action, and attainment of perfection. So here it talks about the purification process. This is, I think, since morning we have discussed about this, that uh, this whole life divine thing is that the spirit actually manifests from the unmanifest Sarchit Ananda and has this uh, descent takes place, whereas the Vedantic or Sankhi position is the, is the Panch Kosha. So, uh, and uh, we know that most of his philosophy lies in integration of these two. I mean, in so many ways, whether you talk about psychic being or about integral yoga psychology, you find the integration of these two happening all across the world. And, 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 and for him, the reality is both. I mean, the, the matter in this. Um, so I'm not going to read this, but here also he talks about the same when he, and why he finds also uh, this uh, tantric perfection, because this actually goes in very much in parallel with his own integral yoga psychology. So, Tantric discipline is nature of synthesis, uh, and he is a synthesizer in so many things, and that's why I think he got very uh, probably attracted to the Tantric literature and practice. Uh, and this Brahman and Shakti is written and nature, the nature is power of the spirit, or rather, the spirit has power, and he talks about bolder and larger system, and then eventually, he talks about the unified consciousness. So, as I said, he talks about the perfection of human beings and then he talks about the unified of unification of these two consciousness consists of perfection of body and non-embodied directions of life divine. 
liberation and lively mind forms a foundation of Satchitananda. I think he doesn't differentiate into it. And then he says that is the reflection of philosophy. So I think uh, now we are, I mean, I'm coming to towards the end. He could say that this Tantri Kriti program is actually a lot of gist of his philosophical exposition in these 30 35 verses. You could find a lot of his you know, philosophical uh, um, understanding about uh, Indian and also Western philosophy as a gist in, in this 35 words. He says both happens and uh, ascent and descent happening without the negation of either the nominal or this nominal. And he again said that matter is the real world and you know, something of divine expression and one can attain perfection realizing the wholeness of this. So he again talks about this wholeness by integrating this cosmic integration of being and becoming. And I think I'm also a little bit convinced that why he was, again, as I said, that this inter integral universal psychology of this system and this plurality of uh, tantric uh, tradition within the uh, tantric tradition, there is a lot of integration. So I think that gives him like a lot of parallels. Uh, these are some of the things I feel could be explored further uh, when we are talking about Aurobindo and, and research on Aurobindo and his writing. So one is Sanskrit and Aurobindo. We should, and I'm not, I have no, uh, I'm not very good in Sanskrit, so probably I need some help in that. But his contribution with these of his Sanskrit has to be explored. I think it is not much being explored. In fact, even this is I think not published, right? This Tantric City problem which you already have not published in like in a book or something. Yeah. And then uh, in the morning also we have seen that uh, to understand Aurobindo, we have to understand a lot of Western philosophy. So I think the time has also uh, come to see a lot of his philosophy in the context of Western philosophy, whether it's the vitalist Balsam or Whitehead or those. So he does that. Like the vitalist, he agrees on most of the things. But in some other cases, he deviates from there. So it would be an interesting mix of research. And for the current times, which I personally feel, we, we should look at him as a social philosopher of self. Because if we look at him as a social philosopher of self and how he can have self enhancement, maybe we can do some more research on him. That's it from my side. Thank you. When was the text written? I think I showed it say 11 and 12. I mean, this is what Sir has. Uh, so we want to thank our young friend in Malanda who is now in Rome. Yes, thank you. Please take your seat. And uh, so this is a completely new approach that I was unaware of. And he has given the credit to this Sankatan and the Mishra. I would also like to be Actually, please be seated. One of the things that uh, is, uh, I mean, the mother was very keen yeah, about the, the teaching of Sanskrit. I remember when I was a student in the school, and we had Sanskrit as a compulsory subject. The mother said that Sanskrit one day should become a national language. But uh, I think it has been a great sadness that uh, I do not have this kind of confidence in Sanskrit that this is not the time to so We had uh, Jagannathji and Shabe and also, and two others also, and uh, a few others who talked about Sanskrit, but I regret that. So, in the context of what you said, and you made so many allusions to Sakyamuni, so I cannot help but request him to say a few words in the in the way of the background to this text. And I know why. I know that this comes. I know that Sri Aurobindo was greatly influenced by Tantra, but in the ashram circles, Tantra is not encouraged. I suspect because of his association with sexuality. I also suspect that the way things can go wrong in a spiritual community. So I, that must be one of the reasons why Tantra is not being encouraged in the actual topic. But something that please tell us the background to this text. Because four years I think Shogunda spent, and the best of his life experience has been in four years. After that, 
the 1914 and Mother Khan's furniture and the Arya put 4 years of Indian sad that he does. Levitation and record of your gods. Please tell us about the background of this place because we know nothing. <coughs> Cicero's integral philosophy, integral program uh, draws much from the Pantheon vision. So, usually the vision of Tantra is lost. Certain aspects of rituals, Tantra rituals, they have been no, pushed out. And that's what people know about this is what is not. We are frightened. <laughs> Morning, I just mentioned um, during my work to Madras. Uh, this is what, like, Sirondo's whole philosophy, where does it lead to? It's the establishment of the divine life on the earth, total transformation of the nature, Rupantara. So we know it as the Rupantara yoga. And Tantra believes in that transformation. So reason of the Tantra is from man animal to man human to man divine. And it, it has its own language. Tantra's language is Pashu, man animal, who is bound. Pashu is bound. Comes from yeah. the root sound Pash. From which you get Pashyati to see. Seeing cannot happen if the vision is not fixed. So, past means to fix. So, anything which is fixed, bound, limited, is Pashu. And ordinarily human consciousness is that Pashu consciousness, which is bound, limited by many limitations. And from there, the liberation in the language of Sri one has to liberate oneself from all these limitations. So then one has an expanded consciousness. From there, one cannot just jump from Pasu to Divya. Tantra uses the language of man human, is a leader. And most of the times, if you are familiar with the writings, and all of us who are familiar with the writings of Sri Aurobindo, the mother, Sri Aurobindo, they use the word hero warrior. And as a prayer to it given, like he, he has been mentioning about like how do we inspire to the youth, to the school children. The prayer is make us a hero warriors. That we aspire to. Yes, that we aspire to. So, hero warriors, leader, means like one who is free from all weaknesses. That's why the mother said, uh, don't come before me and then stand here with your head down. I have committed this mistake. I said, I don't like such children. Stand in front of me, front of me with your, you know, like a head high. I'm your child, mm -hmm. free from all weaknesses, all shortcomings. As long as we carry these weaknesses, shortcomings, and limited, we are not leader. And we can never realize ourselves. The problem is there. You can remain limited by your limited, but we'll never realize the self. Naya Atma Balahine one who is weak can never realize the self. So from Vira, that will prepare us for the last stage, man divine. Divine. Tantra <coughs> uses these three languages, Pashu, Vira, and Divya. In Sri Aurobindo's circle, if some of the scholars who have contributed immensely, linking the Tantra, the vision of the Tantra with Sri Aurobindo, so the credit goes to Vasishta Kavikanta Manpati Muni, his disciple Kapali Shastri, the name of the and Shankar Narayan, who has written this 10 great cosmic novels on the Dasha India. So, the amount of writings that we get from Kapali Shastri and the reason, how they are linked in. When I go through it, they say that to understand Sri it becomes easy. So, for me, like the traditional shastras, the knowledge of Sanskrit is so, uh, you know, complementary, complementary to, to the teachings of Sri Aurobindo. I understand the shastras better than I have read Sri Aurobindo. 
I understand Sri Aurobindo clearly many passages because I have a background of the Tantra and the Vedanta, the original Tradite and Sanskrit. Because Sri Aurobindo's interpretation is based on those root sounds and root experiences of the words. He compares Sanskrit and Greek like many languages. So Tantrika Siddhi Prakaran was a text about which many people didn't know in 2008 when I published it with my own initiatives. When was this text? Uh, it text was in a notebook. Oh. So from the archives I received it and requested that so they gave it to me. I went through it. I made the editing. There were little... Uh, yeah, there is no book. It was for the first time published in uh, the Mother India magazine, 2008, January. So, very new thing that you said. Yes. So, in Tantra Siddhi, the notebook is huge mm. because he wanted to create a treatise on Tantra in Sanskrit. Because there he started experimenting not just English but in Sanskrit. Mm. So, his writing is there on Sri Aurobindo Upanishad, is another writing. Very uh, Upanishad, a Upanishad. So, this Tantra is the proper the text that you saw here presented and what I have translated and presented is just a small section in that where he speaks about the Siddhi and what he talked about that the whole idea of the evolution and evolution that Sri Aurobindo received from. Uh, Swami Vivekananda, along with the idea of super mind and all this, they had this subtle conversation in the Alipur jail. So, these ideas are there very much in the Tantra and the Veda. So, from the Vedic to Tantric and to Sri Aurobindo, if we see, and it becomes easy to understand what this idea of evolution and evolution is presented in the life demand and other places where this. What the Veda speaks, I get just a little bit of idea about the Vedic idea of evolution and evolution. The Tantric idea, the Tantric, it, it is same, but the uh, words, the phrases are different. Now, in the Veda, if you go to the Vedic Vedantic, there is supreme reality, which is Akhanda, indivisible, one without second, Ekameva, Advitya. This is how Sri Aurobindo also begins his own Upanishad Ekameva Adhivishi. Sadasada Titam, Rikala Dhrutam, Rikala Titam. These are the words he uses in his So that supreme reality, that, that is the immediate consciousness, which is again expressed in the Riksha Upanishad as Vidya. And Avidya is this multiplicity. So that one becomes many. When it becomes many, from that unity of consciousness to, from that subtle most to the gross most. So at the gross most level, that unity of consciousness is lost, seems to be lost. But essentially it is there. So, for example, God becoming man <laughs> or this creation. So there is a mechanism of limiting himself. Without limiting, and that limiting mechanism causes there is the Maya. Who is the infinite becomes finite. So this finite at the gross most level it becomes totally lost that unity of consciousness. So this whole journey from the unity of consciousness subtle most to the gross most is called the evolution. The God becoming man. And how it happens because the God has given it. Without this yajna, so this is what is the inner significance of yajna. Now this is half of the story of the creation. Now that unity has to be regained. How? By the emulation of the ego. It is a separative ego sense which doesn't allow <laughs> that unity to be realized. So to annihilate that ego. What is the way given? Self-giving. Shiro <coughs> has a very beautiful sentence. He said to grow by giving. Well, the foundation of this. All those who do not give, they become the poor. They, they are like the eater, eaten. And there is no food. 
there is no consume, digest. So giving the yajna. So from that unity of consciousness to the gross most, and then from there regaining of the unity of consciousness, this whole cycle is involution. Tantra gives the name as a nimesha. To involution, Tantra gives the name nimesha. Nimesha means closing of the eye. And evolution, it gives the name unmesha, the reopening to regain. And by being settled in that state of unity of consciousness, we need to operate in the world. Then that that way the divine life is possible on the earth. Unless and until we regain that unity of consciousness, divine life is not possible. We remain confined to the man animal or to man human, limited by all our limits. Now this Tantrika Siddhi Prakara, where it says that that self-giving has to be total surrender to Kali. And when that total surrender comes, like what he presented, we talk about Tamasiki ego, we talk about Rajasiki ego, hardly Sattvic ego is being talked. So when he talks about the Sattvic ego, which is the most dangerous in it. Very difficult to shatter. So he says, when Kali, by this summer, when Kali enters into the Sattvic, so first thing she does is she removes the Tamasic ego, then Rajasic ego, then the Sattvic ego. But there is again another beautiful thing when we are talking about the Tamas, Rajas and Sattvas. And Gita speaks of the Triguna Pita. What does it mean? Does it mean that we transcend from Tamas to Rajas to Sattva and then beyond that, leave it aside all the Gunas? It's not possible. Without Guna, no oppression will be taking place. The answer given by Sri is so, you know, so much clarity it gives to this whole idea of Tribunami. That's again you will find in the Patrick Siddhi Prakarana. Sri Aurobindo speaks very, you know, uh, precisely. We need to interpret it and we have to, uh, because we don't need to interpret it on our own because Sri Aurobindo's writing is so, uh, so vast. We can collect Sri Aurobindo's passages and add it to those sutras to serve as a commentary on that. So Sri Aurobindo says that Trigunatitutta means like Tamas has its both extreme ends. On the lower side, it is inertia, lethargy, and all these things. But Tamas also has a transformed state. And that transformed state is the pure calmness, tranquility, peace, shanti. As a transformed state, it is shanti. As a lower state, it is all lethargy, inertia. And rajas, as a lower state, it is just passion, desire, ambition, everything. The dynamism of the uh, lower nature. In the transformed state, it is a pure dynamics. Because without rajas, that no work will happen. A pure dynamics. Without the sense of doership, without the sense of you know, ambition or everything. Similarly, the sattva, which is light, but at the transformed state, it is a pure light, a pure truth. So when we say Trigunati Tattva, to become settled in the transformed state of all the three gunas, and then operate from that state of purity. So these are the things that we learn from Tantrika Siddhi Prakarana. When we study the text written by Sri Aurobindo, in the light of sin. So that's what I want to say. There is a book by Pandit Sri Aurobindo Tantra. Yes, so see, now the Tantra is in the Prakarana also. If you want to access, go to incarnate And there you go to the volume for Sanskrit and Bengali writings. So you will find with my English translation and with the chanting of the book sutras also. Any passing remark, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, 
So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mishra, for the beautiful explication that you have given about uh, Chancellor Siddhi Garana. And uh, thanks to our young friend also. I think we got a perspective that we have not had before. So um, uh, I think from the morning, from the inauguration till today, I think with this we come to the end of the deliberation today. I think uh, we've had a uh, very beautiful, very engrossing sessions and uh, punctuated by deep remarks of the different chairpersons. And I'm very honored and privileged that they have been here and given to me. And uh, I cannot really help but to make a few remarks about the ambience, the setting, the lab, and the graphic designer. Who is the graphic designer? This whole thing. Is only... very, very well done. You know, the mother, with her background in Japan, appreciation of art, made so much of emphasis on the aesthetic side of the series. And I think it just added up, added up to the total experience that we have had. And uh, I think it's been a similar good fortune that Professor Mishra and his colleagues and the team have invited us to this modern Guru Kul and where this kind of uh, transmission of knowledge is taking place. You know, creation of knowledge, and then, the, of course, in the colonial period in Malaysia, forget good. And the time has come to recover. Important that we are recovering this knowledge as we have said, for the use of our present and to decide about the future. As we say memorably, we don't belong to the towns of the past, we belong to the moons of the future. That's very good. And uh, so we have a little time, five minutes or so, before we wind up. If there is anybody who wants to say something, I want to say something. Yes, please. Please. Please go from that. Please come. So I'm very happy. Uh, people may think that a uh, small audience is uh, frustrating, but rather a crowd without the true consciousness is a noise, but here the audience is extremely receptive and I don't feel that we are lacking in audience. And another one said that five, the five in the reading sessions, she was, she was surprised. That means five is enough, five are enough. So uh, it is the quality of the audience that matters, not the bulk of the audience. So I'm very happy. And uh, also, uh, I could meet some more friends. He is a long time friend, so I'm with you also. So that others, uh, TV is also here, and Pinato, and uh, everybody is, many are known to me. So I'm very happy, and I would like to thank. Once again, Dr. Shantanarandiji and the university. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you so much for the presentation and Professor uh, Mishra's presentation. So, in this spirit, what are some of the aspects of speech?
Just a few points I want to make in the way of interjection here. One is that I'm always struck by the number of fragments that Shurdin does that. I mean, I wrote a piece on the Shurdin and the problem of Mahabharata, 1898, just at the time of the Mahabharata. And at least four times he thought of really revising. The last time was 1930 also, when Molinita brought it to his attention. And very interesting, the direction in it which it could have gone. And you mentioned about the Tamil Swal. It was published in the Tamil journal. And talking about the chronology and the dates of the mother. And he's trying to really give the, the idea is that is it a coherent body of poetry or are there interpolations? And he's looking at rhetoric as a way of suggesting that it is a coherent body. Although there might have been later on some extrapolations. That's what he's doing. Future poetry. At the end of the publication of the future poetry also, you find two or three fragments. The direction in which he wanted to go. Okay. So, none of these books is really copied in that sense. Foundations of Indian culture. Many people might take it as authority. It isn't, because there are some chapters that he wanted to write in development. Those are also not copied. And then fragments of poetry, years, which he takes up. And then he. Now, here we are in a situation. Where our own finances are secured by the state, and we have ample holiday. We are not under threat of being deported to Algeria or deported to Kadalur, spirited away by the agents of the British, just waiting beyond the border of Pondicherry to Kadalur. Every other day, there's a threat of being deported to Kadalur, deported to Algeria. And the problem of not only your own self, but looking after at least half a dozen people who are around you. You don't have a source of money. I'm talking about Kali, writing a letter to Kali, and if we say rich, some money, so that we can have some basic food also. Now we must not forget about the existential conditions in which you are going to live. You know, I think it was. To put it very mildly, it was very sad, very painful. When you talk, you read a poem like God's Labor, you really understand he doesn't have until the arrival of the mother, you are completely neglected. You know, once uh, Amrita touched the feet and, and then showed him the, sorry, it's a perfect gentleman. Remember what the mother says. Sure, we may be a gentleman, but I am not. The bad behavior shown towards him is not permissible. Turn them away. So I think there is an existential side which we must not forget. And within this relative short period, for example, and the way he has been brought up, no, I mean, the, his rights, cowardice, coward was in me, the fear was in me, and he acknowledges because of this. A very complicated way of being brought up by Katie Ghosh. Very complicated way. You have to be a perfect Englishman. You must not really be contaminated by Bengali and the Indian languages. And then sending him there and then forgetting about spending the money also. And managing with bread and this. I think you say me last, we are attending, we have food, everything. And I don't think that I have suffered from starvation at all in my life. Look at these three brothers. Suffering from starvation. I mean, we in seminars on Shurabindo, we don't talk about this. They're very important. How he's overcome that. First writing, you read the A.B. Purani's biography of Shurabindo. Chance has been given, and you know, he's unable to really read. And then somebody's writing on his behalf, you know, they have really suffered from you know, starvation and all that. Please give them a chance. I think it's very, very painful. What he has done. He He's never he never complained. No, other people did. Because they wanted him to join the Indian civil service. Possibly one line of Sanskrit But Sanskrit like all Irish languages, the dynamism in and of itself. 
We see in Sadiq, in Sadiq, please, Sri Arabic was and the kind of the way each sentence also becomes a mantra suggests that this journey with Sanskrit just limited to language in the sphere of science. But how that Sanskrit dimension also can be cultivated in a language like English. Also, he has. Mixed up Sanskrit with English, Sanskrit uh, adjective, uh, English noun. But the Supreme is manifest forever as the everlasting Sachidananda. The everlasting adjective, Sachidananda noun. And he has done it uh, frequently. Plus, uh, that rhetoric, which uh, one uses as synonyms for one word. In Vivekananda, in other writers, the same thing is report, uh, repeated as synonyms. But when, when Sri Aurobindo serializes them, or uh, his the procession of serials, of synonyms, it always evolves. Because from catharsis, it becomes Chittusuddhi. Chittusuddhi is a far greater word than catharsis. This, uh, Upward uh, movement with Sanskrit synonyms. This is an interesting part of Sri Aurobindo's post time. And this happens frequently in this of the I just want to implement that. Ananda has got the point of the <coughs> importance of Sanskrit and the fact that it can be a, a great treasure trove and repertoire of spiritual wisdom and mystical wisdom, which is used in short. That point is very well different. But also, you find in your window that not only there is an endorsement of the Marga and the classical tradition, but also the Desha. That you find. You know, while he's talking about the greatness of Sanskrit, for example, as a source of understanding, for example, the Vedas and the Upanishad, look at his understanding of Guru Albar, the Tamil texts, the Subramanya Bharati. When I lived for 11 years, for example, in Pondicherry, how much of Tamil do I have access to? So that was not really essential. That was not, uh, nobody put a gun and said, you have to, because we're living in Pondicherry, you have to learn Sanskrit, Tamil. No. The person, he knew that Tamil is an ancient kind of thing. Tamil has a great wisdom, literature, and you know, spiritual wisdom, as a guru and others. I'll go one step forward. And I would like to be corrected in this kind of proposition that I make. Shurabindo was a great admirer of the Kaman Ramayana also. Great admirer of Tulsidas and Kabir in all the Indian languages. So it is not this versus that, this and that. Shurabindo's approach in the Kabishan spirit culture, the temples that he is talking about in South India, Unfortunately, the later editions of publications in culture have brought the photographs and used the photographs that he is referring to. I think it's phenomenal. I mean, the, the respect and the appreciation and the admiration that he has for all the Indian languages, all the traditions of our land, he doesn't make any distinction between the elite and the folk also. The folk, so many references to Kabir, for example, Tulsidas and Surdas. Is giving me references. I think it's amazing. I mean, we with our own access to internet and all that, we haven't even done justice. A friend is from Tamil Nadu. How much of uh, respect she is giving to Namal or he has translated yes. Namal or Tamil? Yes. The the first thing that he did, yes. And one of the first things that the mother did is that all and Gutunda is now serving the Oregon Foundation. He said there will be no workers in Oregon. All the workers would become Oregonians. They're building the new city of the future. They will not be sort of workers. Look at the great socialist vision that we have. And the respect for Tamil culture. We must have a profound respect for Tamil culture also. And other languages. 
we must not be so ill advised to think that one language is imposed. It is it, it predates Sanskrit. I always realize that that will predate Sanskrit as a language, as an ancient language, as a classical language. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So you and uh, his uh, way of writing the connection with the and the language study Sanskrit. So you know, he himself has written in uh, one of his letters to those Sanskrit, but he has uh, tried to capture the Kalidashian and Upanishadic movement as much as possible in Kalidashian and Upanishadic movement. Poetic spirit. Point one. Point two, if we try to understand the idea of mantra from your confused poet, all that he has written about the mantra. So that makes it clear that there is no single language which is a language of mantra. Any language can be limited from the state of inertia to the level of mantra. It all depends upon who is using that. If Abhir Das is using, making his Doha in Avadi, also mantra. Yorubindo has raised the English from its level of inertia to the level of mantra himself. So it, it will have the same value like Veda mantra. That's why Mother says is the Veda of the future. Another thing, talking about science and then linking it with the tantra and Sri Aurobindo's yoga, let's take one aspect, the science of language, the way Sri Aurobindo has interpreted the Veda mantras by going deep into every root sound and the root experiences. And then there is a list of meanings which he has given to every vowel and consonant. If you contemplate and try to understand that, a lot of background of Matrika Vijnana, Asmishaivism, it's very much necessary to go deep into the understanding of what Sri speaks about the meaning that experiences behind these words. For example, like he says, the sound of is absolute state of existence. And E is the related state of existence. R is the vibrant state of existence. U is the pervasive state of existence. Similarly, ka, 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 ka. all these things. And where do you find the detailed explanation of these things? So you have to go to the Tantra Vita. The amount of information that one finds on the single characters and Vija Akshara's in the Kashmir Shaivism and in the Vividya tradition, with regard to the letter, no other tradition has. This is where you see a great link between Sri Aurobindo and the these are the three remarks. So, thank you so much, Abhishek Tripathi ji, for presenting your paper, and uh, Sachidan and Mangti ji, professor, for uh, conducting and moderating the entire uh, afternoon session uh, with such clarity, and uh, you engaged everyone, and we were. We were uh, worried that we will not be able to conduct a panel discussion at the end of today's session, but uh, but uh, consequently it, it, it happened. Sort of. So thank you, sir, and thank you, Anantaji, for uh, asking uh, really important questions from everybody and uh, making this uh, event more engaging. And uh, thank you, uh, Gautamji and uh, Digantaji and uh, 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 Ma'am and. Uh, uh, Rama Swami ji and uh, Sadoj Khan Mishra ji, Priya ji and uh, everyone for joining us today. Uh, I would like to thank Harsh for managing everything. Ajay yeah, Bhaiya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Saurabh and uh, uh, of course Sampas sir uh, for, for making this entire event happening. So with this we will move Just on. Announce more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. announcement I will make. Oh. Yeah, I was very happy that Gautam Ra mentioned about a very important point about giving a very small group. 
before this seminar happened, I very consciously I knew that it will be only our group which will be discussing amongst ourselves because here there are no students who will be interested in Sri Aurobindo. When devotees of Sri Aurobindo are not interested in studying Sri Aurobindo, <laughs> so it is going to be discussing amongst ourselves. And small group, so let's try to make it as much you know, uh, useful for us. And this all are going to be documented and then shared later. And tomorrow is not going to be here. Tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we will be going to our boardroom where uh, you know that it will be uh, more focused and the technology also will be slightly better so then the online viewers can experience a uh, little better because the camera is very far so they would see only just little hazy image of the speaker on the online. So it will be in the boardroom tomorrow and they are tomorrow. Uh, come, come, come. So when you uh, come from the mess the last on the periphery. So we will uh, meet there tomorrow and there. Okay. Okay. So uh, I would also like to request all our invited guests to please uh, share with us the receipts of uh, the the travel expenses with us, uh, which they had to bear while coming to the airport from their home, and uh, also uh, mention uh, their bank account details and. Uh, uh, their name, bank, bank's name, IFSC code, and bank of, yeah, yeah, those who have not yet given, so, and, yeah, yeah, so please uh, mail that to auto studies at rashtram.org, A U R O S T U D I E S at the rate rashtram.org. So, with this, we will proceed uh, for the snacks, but uh, before that, we will, yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. So that's what I was saying that before that we will observe a minute of silence and then we can call it. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We will meet for uh, the second uh, session uh, tomorrow in the boardroom on the ground floor. So, thank you.